Order. <laughs> Colleagues, welcome back to our place of work. The UK Supreme Court ruled yesterday that Parliament has not been prorogued and that the Speaker of the House of Commons and the Lord Speaker can take immediate steps to enable each House to meet as soon as possible to decide upon a way forward. I will arrange for the citation for that judgment to be entered in the journal of this House and accordingly direct that the item relating to the prorogation of Parliament in the journal of Monday, 9th September, is expunged. Yeah. And the House is instead recorded as adjourned at the close of the business. I instruct the clerk to correct the journal accordingly and to record the House to have adjourned at the close of business on Monday, 9th September, until today. Members should also be aware the royal assent to the parliamentary buildings, brackets, restoration and renewal, close brackets, bill, which formed part of the royal commission appointed under the quashed order in council, will need to be re-signified. I wish to record my thanks, and I hope colleagues across the House will join me in doing so, to the staff of the House, yeah. including the security, catering, chamber business, parliamentary, digital and in-house services teams who have worked exceptionally hard over the past 24 hours to prepare for this resumption. You will know but in the name of the public intelligibility of our proceedings, I think it worthwhile to note that there is no ministerial question time today, including, therefore, no prime ministerial question time. The reason for that is very simple. As colleagues will be aware, there are notification requirements. Questions ordinarily are tabled three sitting days before the exchanges take place. So there is no Prime Minister's questions today. However, there is scope, as I indicated in public yesterday, for urgent questions, for ministerial statements and other business. Speaking of which, colleagues, order. Urgent question, Joanna Cherry. Yeah. to ask the Attorney General if he will make a statement about his legal opinion on the advice given to Her Majesty the Queen to prorogue Parliament. Yeah. 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 Mr General, Mr Geoffrey Cock. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker as uh, the Honourable Lady knows, the Supreme Court gave judgment on this issue yesterday. And that judgment sets out the definitive and final legal position on the advice given to Her Majesty on the prorogation of Parliament. The government's legal view during the case was set out and argued fully before the Supreme Court. The hearing was streamed live and the government's written case was and is available on the Supreme Court website. I took a close interest in the case. <laughs> saw the government's team of counsel. And um, I have to say, I have to say, Mr Speaker, that if every time I lost a case, I was called upon to resign, I probably would never have had a practice. <laughs> and the government, and the government, and the government accepts, the government accepts uh, the judgment and accepts that it lost the case. And at all times, the government acted in good faith and in the belief and in the belief that its approach was both lawful and constitutional. These are complex matters, 
on which senior and distinguished lawyers will disagree. And the Divisional Court and the Divisional Court, led by the Lord Chief Justice, as well as Lord Doherty in the Outer House of Scotland, agreed with the government's position. But we were disappointed that in the end the Supreme Court took a different view. And of course, we respect the judgment of the court. Given the Supreme Court's judgment, in legal terms, the matter is settled. And as the Honourable Lady will know, I am bound by the long-standing convention that the views of the law officers are not disclosed outside the government without their consent. However, I will consider over the coming days whether the public interest might require a greater disclosure of the advice given to the government on this subject. I am unable to give an undertaking or a promise to the Honourable Lady at this point, but the matter is under consideration. Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also took a close interest in, in the case. And, um, I can let me start by assuring the Attorney General that I'm not going to call for his resignation yet. Um, Mr. Speaker, yesterday, yesterday was a very special day for Scots law and the Scottish legal tradition, yeah, going yeah. back to the Declaration of Arbroath that the government is not above the law. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Following in the footsteps of Scotland's Supreme Court, the UK Supreme Court asserted the rule of law, the separation of powers, and they restored democracy. And it's worth emphasising that their decision was unanimous, yep. as was the decision of Scotland's Supreme Court, yep. unanimous, chaired by Scotland's most senior judge, the Lord President of the Court of yeah, Session. Exactly. Both of these courts unanimously found that the decision to advise Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament was unlawful, void and of no effect. But the question, Mr Speaker, I'm interested in is how did it come to pass that this was ever allowed to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Redacted documents lodged with the Scottish Court confirm the suspicion that this was a plan cooked up in number 10 by the Prime Minister and his special advisers. But the, what I want to ask about is documents that mysteriously found their way into the public domain yesterday afternoon when an unredacted version of one of the documents lodged with the Scottish Court found its way to Sky News and revealed that the Attorney General had said that the advice to prorogue was lawful and anyone who said otherwise was doing so for political reasons. No. Now, what I want to ask the Attorney General specifically is this. I'm sure knowing him that his advice was considerably more detailed and nuanced than the three sentences that appear in that unredacted document. Can he tell us whether a legal opinion was made available to the Prime Minister or the Cabinet? The Right Honourable Member for Hastings and Rye has said that when she was in the Cabinet, Cabinet Ministers requested to see the advice, but it wasn't handed over. Is that correct? And can he tell us what was given to the PM, if not to the Cabinet? Because, Mr Speaker, many of us believe that the Attorney General is being offered up as a fall guy for the Prime Minister's yeah, 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 yeah. So does he not agree with me that to release the advice in its entirety will help him avoid being the scapegoat for a plan that was dreamed up by the Prime Minister and his advisers? And will he give the undertaking that he has hinted that he's thinking of giving today? Yeah. 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 I'm extremely grateful for the Honourable Lady's solicitousness and kindness for my welfare. <laughs> and I, I am particularly um, uh, attracted by the tempting prospect that the Honourable Lady dangles before me. But she will know that I am obliged by the Convention to say that I am not permitted to disclose the advice that I may or may not have given to the government. But I repeat, the matter is under consideration. Mr Kenneth Clark. Does my uh, right honourable and learned friend agree <coughs> that if in the future we were unfortunate enough to have a Corbyn Easter Labour government. Yeah. <laughs> 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 obviously, 
Obviously not. Try it again. Obviously not thought to be a very likely prospect. <laughs> 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 and if that were that, yeah, that you, misfortune were to occur, uh, and if that government were to decide to suspend the House for a long period because there was a parliamentary majority against its principal policy, uh, and if that government also decided that constitutional law was not challenged by that and challenged the right of the courts to overrule <laughs> it, the Conservative Party would be likely to get very excited. Uh, can he reassure me that this Supreme Court judgment has settled that matter finally, mm. that this kind of action can never be taken by any future government, and that parliamentary sovereignty <coughs> therefore remains intact? Yeah. Well, I, I certainly can say to my right honourable and learned friend that it is important when we reflect upon judgments that may be seen to go against the short-term interests of any particular government, that they stand as precedents and principles for the future. And I invite all my uh, honourable friends to reflect on precisely the situation which my right honourable friend has set out before the House, which is that this would stand for governments of a colour with which my side would not approve of, and for their actions too. And so it is important that when we comment upon the decisions of judges, we remember that those judges are both impartial and independent, and they are entitled to reach the view that they have reached. We are fortunate in this House to have one of the finest judiciaries, I believe, in the world. And it is important to remember that the principles they set apply to both sides, as the Right Honourable Gentleman has said. Nick Thomas Simmons. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I congratulate the Honourable and Learned Lady for Edinburgh South West, both for securing this urgent question and indeed her work in this matter. Yesterday's decision of the Supreme Court, and I give credit to all those who brought the cases, was the most damning judicial indictment of a government in modern times. Yeah. That the decision to advise Her Majesty the Queen to prorogue Parliament was unlawful. This government stands in shame, tendering illegal advice to our monarch and not even able to uphold that most basic but most important of principles, abiding by the rule of law. And what we know from yesterday's leaked document is the Attorney General said his advice on the question of the law was that this was lawful and within the Constitution, and that any accusation of unlawfulness, he said, were motivated by political considerations. If that is in any way accurate as to his full advice, he was wrong on both counts. Yes. His close interest simply wasn't enough. Now, I'll ask the Attorney General a number of questions. Can he confirm why it was? The government gave no witness statement to the court, and indeed the court was left in a position where it said, no justification for taking action with such an extreme effect was put before the court. Why not? He talks, Mr Speaker, about respecting the decision of the judges, but the Cabinet Office Minister was on the radio this morning saying that he disagrees with the decision. Incredible. Tell us which parts of the judgment the government disagrees with. And in his considerations over the next few days about the publication of this advice, can I just give him a simple piece of advice, a simple suggestion, just publish it and make it open to Parliament and the public. Yeah. Mr Speaker, on this Attorney General's watch, the government has been found in contempt of Parliament. Yeah. Now it has been found in contempt of the law. Incredible. Doesn't he just accept he hasn't got a shred of credibility left? Yeah. Well, um, I don't know whether, in his practice, when he was at the bar, he felt that just because he'd given advice that might not have been upheld by a court, he had no credibility. That is an absurd and ridiculous proposition. Furthermore, it was advice that was agreed with by the first instance court in Scotland and by the Lord Chief Justice of England. Is the right honourable gentleman calling for his resignation as well? Is he? Is he calling for the resignation of the Master of the Roll? Is he calling for the resignation of the President of the Queen's Bench Division? Is he calling for Lord Doherty's resignation? I will say this. I will say this, Mr Speaker. Order! Order! 
order. The Attorney General will just resume his seat momentarily. I should be deeply obliged to him. The Attorney General has a distinctive and resonant baritone, which is well known throughout the House, but it is a challenge even to him to be fully heard if there is constant catcalling. There will be ample opportunity for colleagues to question and probe the Attorney General. Of that, they may be assured. But I <laughs> wish myself to listen to his mellifluous tones. The Attorney General. I will say this, Mr Speaker, for the Scottish Nationalist Party and for the Honourable Lady, if I may. Whereas in the Honourable Gentleman's case, no shameless piece of cynical opportunism is left on the floor. Oh. <laughs> this, the second, the Honourable Lady is a lawyer and a Queen's Counsel, and she knows it is the most puerile, puerile, infantile of criticism to say about a lawyer whose advice has been upheld by courts right up the way to the Supreme Court, but somehow or other that advice he should be held culpable for. The fact of the matter is, this advice was sound advice at the time. The court, the court, the court of last resort ultimately disagreed with it. But in doing so, they made new law, as they were entirely entitled to do. Mr Dominic Grieve. So, so th so thank you, Mr Speaker. I I'm extremely mindful of the difficult task that my right honourable and learned friend has as an Attorney General in providing advice to government. And indeed, I'm sorry if his legal advice uh, has been partially leaked, because he is entitled to give advice in private, without which he cannot do his work. And I would also say that for him to get the law wrong in an area of uh, difficulty is not necessarily something to be held to his discredit. But he may agree with me. But one of the issues in this matter was not just law, but propriety. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the propriety went to the unconstitutional or constitutional nature of the act of prorogation itself in view of the motivation of the government for doing it. And in those circumstances, I was struck by the fact in the leaked document that his opinion is referred to as believing it is constitutional when I'd understood from comments he made as far back, I think, as July, when prorogation was first being mooted in order to achieve a no-deal Brexit on the 31st of October, that he considered that such an act would be unconstitutional. And I wondered, therefore, if this isn't one issue which he ought not to clarify. I, I know that my right honourable and learned friend will understand that it is not right for the Attorney General or for any Cabinet Minister to comment upon leaks of matters that have occurred within Cabinet, be they accurate or inaccurate. It would be setting a wholly undesirable precedent. But let me say this. Um, a position some weeks ago was being mooted that Parliament might be prorogued from the beginning of September or even earlier until the 31st of October. I say straight away to the, my right honourable friend, if that had been the proposition, I could not have stayed in the Cabinet whilst it was done. Hilary Ben. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. Does the, does the Attorney General believe that yesterday's judgment of the Supreme Court represented a constitutional coup? And if he does not share that view, could he explain to the House why he thinks that that is wrong? General! I, I don't think it was a constitutional coup, and I know the Right Honourable Lady... The right Honourable Gentleman! <laughs> right Honourable Gentleman! Uh, my honourable gentlemen, we will know that I do, and I don't believe that anybody does. These things can be said in the heat, can be said in the heat of rhetorical and poetical licence. But this was a judgment. 
This was a judgment of the Supreme Court of a, a kind which was clear and definitive. It often happens that governments lose cases. We didn't agree with it because, of course, we argued against it. But we accept the ruling of the Supreme Court and we are proud that we have a country capable of giving independent judgments of this kind. Bob Neill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the Attorney's very clear statement of the importance which he, and I'm sure the whole government, attaches to the impartiality and independence of the judiciary? That is most welcome. Uh, can I also say to him uh, that many lawyers might well have given exactly the same advice as he did uh, on the weight of precedent? Uh, does he accept, however, that it is most important that the convention, that the advice that the attorney gives uh, to government uh, is not leaked and is not disclosed, but uh, should not be uh, lightly set aside? But would he also perhaps uh, consider that it's rather regrettable uh, that such an important matter, which warrants very careful and calm and considered language and discussion should be used uh, for the purpose yes. of uh, rather unworthy ad hominem attacks uh, and a party political knockabout uh, when so much is at stake. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm a grateful to my honourable and learned friend's uh, question there. I do, of course, agree with him that their legal advice and particularly the role of the attorney it is always difficult because one polices and intersects a very difficult line between giving advice of an impartial, politically impartial character and being a political minister. But I hope that I have endeavoured to do that with all of the conscience and candour at my disposal. And when I say to the House, as I do today, I accept we lost. We got it wrong on the judgment of the Supreme Court, but it was a respectable view on the law to take. And that uh, view was taken by four out of the seven judges who would opined up to the point of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has made new law. Let's be absolutely clear. From now on, from now on, the prerogative power of Her Majesty, advised by the Prime Minister, can now be the subject, justiciable subject, of the Court's control. And that was a judgment that the Supreme Court was perfectly entitled to make. What the implications are for the future of our constitutional arrangements will have to be reflected upon in the coming months and years. But it is never wise to reflect upon a court case and its, uh, its implications in its immediate aftermath. It will have to be done carefully and deliberately, and this House will have to decide ultimately whether these matters and these powers are for this House to regulate and control or whether they are for the judiciary. But at the moment, the Supreme Court has spoken, and that is the law. Yvette Cooper. The Attorney General's acceptance at that point that the government got it wrong in this case is very welcome. So will he now advise the Prime Minister and the government to accept and agree with the content of this Supreme Court judgment, not just the obligation to abide by its conclusion, and in particular to accept that it is wrong for this government or any government to seek to prorogue Parliament for five weeks rather than just for a few days without giving any reason, let alone, in the words of the <coughs> Supreme Court, a good reason, to the public, to Parliament or to the courts that that was wrong. Hear, hear. Well, I, 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 I say to the uh, honourable, right honourable lady that the, the judgment is clear. Uh, the government is assessing its short and long term implications now, but she can be quite certain that the government will abide by its ruling and by the content and implications of its judgment. And Sir John Redwood. Uh, what limits are there on the powers of the Supreme Court to intervene in how Parliament conducts its business? And what powers are there for them to intervene over the highly political matter of when and how we leave the European Union? Um, I, I think I understood my right honourable friend's question correctly. Um, the, 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 the court in this case the court in this case was giving its judgment on a particular issue, whether or not a prorogation of this length could be the subject of judicial control 
And if so, what was the correct test to apply to that judicial control? And it chose to delineate a test which suggests that from now on, a prorogation of any length must be reasonably justified. That will, the court included in its analysis, the fact that there was before the House and before the country now, a particularly acute constitutional controversy, which made it even more important that the House should sit. I have to say, and I think there's nothing wrong in venturing to express respectful disagreement, that what that will mean in future is that the court will be obliged to assess whether or not a particular political controversy is sufficiently serious, excites sufficiently, excites sufficiently, sufficiently uh, heated controversy and it, it, as to warrant the House sitting for any particular length of time. But be that as it may, that is the test the Court has set, and that is the test that now must be applied. Dr Sarah Wollaston. Thank you, Mr Speaker. What message does the Attorney General have for his colleagues in government who have been smearing and undermining Supreme Court judges? Uh, none, none, some of this is not done in the heat of the moment. Uh, we've been hearing from one journalist that he's been sent <coughs> copies of articles about Iranian judges comparing Supreme Court judges with them. Is he going to give an unequivocal message to his colleagues that they should resign if they undermine the Supreme Court's independence? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, uh, the judges do not exist immune from criticism. There is nothing wrong at all in any member of the public, be a member of parliament or otherwise, in criticising a court judgment. But what is wrong is that motives of an improper kind should be imputed to any judge in this country. We are defenders of the entire con uh, democratic constitution. And we must be sure in everything we say, and I agree with the Honourable Lady if this is what she means, that we do not impute improper motives. With the judgments, we can be robustly critical. With the motives, we cannot. Jeremy Wright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is it not important, even in the course of argument on matters as important as these, to remember why we have the constitutional conventions that we do, and that government is entitled, as any other organisation or individual is, to receive legal advice in private. And if it does not, and if those who ask for it to be published get their way, what will happen is that legal advice will become increasingly guarded, increasingly equivocal, and progressively less useful to government in ministerial decision-making. And the consequence of that will be less good legal advice and less good ministerial decision making. Well, my, uh, my right honourable and learned friend has great experience, as does my right honourable and learned friend sitting next to him, of the role which I now have the great privilege to occupy. And he knows how important confidentiality is to the ability of the attorney to give frank, unvarnished advice sometimes unwelcome advice to those who are conducting the policy of the government. So he's quite right. And uh, he dis discharged his functions, as did my right honourable friend for uh, Beaconsfield, uh, with great distinction. And I'm proud to have been a successor of theirs. Angela Eagle. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The right honourable and learned gentleman has made it quite clear that the judges in the Supreme Court had every right to come to the decision they came to, and in fact they came to it unanimously in an excoriating <coughs> judgment which should put the government's front bench to shame. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is his view, therefore, of a leader of the House who persists in believing and makes it known that he feels the Supreme Court have instituted a constitutional coup. Surely he cannot remain in his post if he has that view. Yeah. 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 There, there is nothing wrong with expressing robust, critical views about a judgment. About a judgment. Insofar as it imputes in, inappropriate or improper motive, then it is wrong. So I think it's a question of wording 
and of being careful with one's language. But I took that remark, insofar as I saw it reported, simply to be a robust criticism of the judgment and nothing more, which is entitled. Sir Oliver Letwin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I have absolute respect for the integrity and the competence of the Attorney General. In the light of what he has told the House this morning, can he guarantee absolutely that, save potentially a few days before a Queen's speech, there can be no question of his permitting Her Majesty's Government to have a prorogation between now and the time of 31st October of this year? What I, what I can undertake to my right honourable friend is that there will be no prorogation that doesn't comply with the terms of the judgment of the Supreme Court. Megalia. Mr Speaker, the Attorney General said that he's going to review whether advice should be published, but in answer to the former Attorney General, he upheld and defended the privacy of that legal advice. So can he tell the House the scope of the review he's undertaking? Is it just when the government is defeated in the Supreme Court, or will it be drawn more widely? Um, well, <laughs> what I'm considering is the public interest and whether or not there are factors in this case connected closely with the public interest generally that should outweigh the Law Officers' Convention and lead to disclosure. But that isn't only my decision. I'm in the position in a, in a rough and approximate way between a lawyer and his client. And I must, uh, I must ensure that there's proper consultation, proper reflection on what the public interest requires. And that I have undertaken to the right honourable lady who asked the urgent question, to do. And in due course, I will make my mind up. Sir Christopher Chope. Mr Speaker, did it come as a surprise to my right honourable and learned friend that the Supreme Court ruled that the act of prorogation is not a proceeding in Parliament? And if that is the new law to which my right honourable friend has referred, uh, would it be open to this Parliament to change the law back to what we thought it was before? Um, uh, it, did it come as a surprise, my honourable friend asked me? Um, quite a lot about the judgment came as a surprise. <laughs> uh, but uh, that particular part... That particular part proceeded from a quite strict or narrow interpretation of the Bill of Rights and what was a proceeding, and it was interpreted to apply the protection afforded by the Bill of Rights to the core and essential business of Parliament. Uh, and it was held, as the honourable, my honourable friend will know, by the Supreme Court, that uh, uh, such a proceeding, namely the uh, execution of the Queen's Commission in the Lords in the presence of Mr Speaker and the, uh, those who attended uh, that proceeding was not sufficiently close to its core and essential business to attract the protection of the Bill. It would of course be open to this House to decide to legislate otherwise and no doubt that's one of the implications of this judgment that will have to be reflected upon in the coming months and years. Um, I know that... Um, that uh, it, there was a widespread view that it was indeed a proceeding in Parliament. But the Supreme Court is as entitled to redefine, or at least to take a view of its definition of the protection afforded by the Bill of Rights, as it is to invent a new legal principle as it did in this judgment. Mr Speaker, could, I'm sure many of us would like to congratulate the Honourable Learned Member for Edinburgh South West yeah. and Gina Miller for making sure that this remains a sovereign parliament. Yeah. Um, the Honourable Lady asked a question of the attorney which he hasn't answered. He asked, she asked him whether he could confirm that the cabinet or members of the cabinet, and he's a member of that cabinet, had asked to see his advice, but they were denied that opportunity. Can he confirm <coughs> that... His advice was requested by fellow members of the Cabinet, but it was denied. Yeah. Well, let me, let, me, let me make plain that I have never denied any member of the Cabinet 
um, any sight of any advice of mine. Um, I, I, I am not certain uh, who and, and when uh, else uh, um, uh, uh, asked for that advice, but I certainly have never denied it. Rory Stewart. Mr Speaker, right honourable and learned friend agree that rather than being some newfangled, innovative decision, this was a profoundly conservative decision yeah. by the Supreme Court asserting the ancient sovereignty of Parliament, and that fundamentally the principle at stake here is that, of course, neither that court nor any other court should determine whether Brexit takes place. That decision has been made by the people. But it is for this House, the only directly elected representatives of the people, to determine the form in which that Brexit happens. Um, let, let me say to, to, to the, my right honourable friend um, that the, the Supreme Court invoked the principle of parliamentary sovereignty and the uh, principle, the Convention of Parliamentary Accountability, Ministerial Accountability to Parliament, as a justification for making justiciable the decision to prorogue. And that's what it was entitled to do, and it effectively amounts to converting a political convention into a legal rule. That uh, traditionally was not thought to be possible. The Supreme Court has decided that it is, and I certainly do not in any way complain with its right to do so. Um, but what I would say to uh, my honourable friend is I would agree with him that Parliament has to determine the terms on which we leave. But this Parliament, has declined three times to pass a withdrawal act with which the opposition in relation to the withdrawal act had absolutely no objection and it was then we now have a wide number of this house setting its face against leaving at all and when this government draws the only logical inference from that position which is that it must leave, therefore, without any deal at all. It still sets its face, denying the electorate the chance of having its say, its say in how this matter should be resolved. This parliament is a dead parliament. It should no longer sit. It has no moral right to sit on these green benches and whatever. come to order. We've got a lot of business to transact. There is a further urgent question. There are no fewer, I say, for the benefit of those observing five ministerial statements. The attorney must be heard, and so, I hope, will lots of other people. The attorney. They don't like to hear it, Mr Speaker. They don't like the truth. Twice they have been asked to let the electorate decide upon whether they should continue to sit in their seats while they block 17.4 million people's votes. This parliament is a disgrace. Given, given the opportunity, given, since, since I am asked, let me tell them the truth. They could vote no confidence at any time, but they're too cowardly. They could agree to a motion to allow this house to dissolve, but they're too cowardly. To this parliament should have the courage to face the electorate. But it won't. It won't. Because so many of them are really all about preventing us leaving the European Union at all. But the time is coming. The time is coming, Mr. Speaker, when even these turkeys won't be able to prevent Christmas. David Hunt 
Jackson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I think the Attorney General will find that the moral right I have to sit in this House is due to an election called by the Honourable Lady for Maidenhead, which she lost 40 seats in. And I will represent my constituents as long as I sit in this House, and I'm here elected by the people to do so. Could he just tell, could he tell this House how much taxpayers' money has he spent in closing down our voice? All I'm suggesting to the honourable gentleman is that he gives is that he gives his constituents the chance yes. of electing him again. Order! 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 I say to the honourable gentleman, the member for Kingston upon Hull East, that as a result of my prodigious efforts last week, audiences in New York, Boston and Zurich are now aware of the honourable gentleman as the noisiest member of the House. I always enjoy listening to the honourable gentleman, but preferably when he's on his feet rather than in his seat. The Attorney General. If the honourable gentleman is so confident that his electorate will consider that his moral right to sit here is so strong, why doesn't he submit it to them now? All we need, all we need, I offer this to the front bench of the Labour Party, all we need is a one-line bill that we could put through with the Speaker's help, fixing the date of the general election by a simple majority, and we could have the election. Why doesn't he tell his front bench to put his confidence in his constituents to the test? Mr. Ian Duncan Smith. Mr. Speaker, I wonder if uh, my right honourable learned friend, (coughs) having read uh, the full summary of the judgment made yesterday uh, by the Supreme Court, was also struck by something that seemed to be missing within their methodology. That when they stood up, they said, for the right of Parliament to hold any executive to account. At no point in there did they reference one of the ways, of course, of avoiding prorogation or dismissing it would have been to have had a vote of confidence in the government or to have voted for a general election. Does he not agree with me that that would have been the surefire way of the opposition parties to have secured an end to any prorogation and an immediate change of government, if so wished, but they were frightened? Yes, I... I entirely agree with my right honourable friend. In our constitution, when a government can no longer govern because the parliament has withdrawn its assent, the moral and constitutional thing to do is have the courage of your convictions, which this spineless gang on the front bench here do not, to place a motion of no confidence before the House. But they haven't got the guts to put that motion of no confidence because most of them don't want their own leader in power. <laughs> Carol Monaghan. Maybe say, first of all, to the Attorney General that none of us in these benches are worried about a general election. has suggested that the unanimous verdict of the Supreme Court was the equivalent of the view of just a few academics, and the Leader of the House has described the verdict as a constitutional coup. Now, unfortunately, these views do gain traction amongst members of the public. So will the Attorney General take this opportunity to give a strong statement of support both for the judgment of the Supreme Court and for the importance of the independence of the judiciary? I think, in answer to the last point, if I may, of the Honourable Lady, I completely, firmly support the independence of our judiciary. In Scotland, in England, in Wales and in Northern Ireland, we have one of the finest judiciaries in the world. And the fact of the matter is the Supreme Court gave its judgment and its judgment must be respected. But that does not prevent robust criticism of the terms of that judgment, which will, I have no doubt, be subjected to that criticism. That is onside. What is not onside is the imputation of improper or inappropriate motives. Sir Desmond Swain. My right honourable friend, the member for Chingford, is right, Mr Speaker. We had notice of the intention to prorogue. With your assistance, 
we could have entertained motions against it or even a motion of no confidence. So it was a coup, wasn't it? Well, I, again, I, I know that uh, I know that my uh, right honourable friend will know that I'm, I want to be, if I can, and when it comes to the judges, though not to this shower, but when it comes to the judges, <laughs> when it comes to the judges, I want to be respectful and careful. And it is important that we should understand that these judges are protectors of all our freedoms and all our rights. Order, order, order. I don't normally offer stylistic advice to the Attorney General, but his tendency to perambulate while orating is disagreeable to the House. He should face the House with confidence and assurance and an acknowledgement that the House wishes to hear his every utterance, the Attorney General. I wonder if you, Mr. Speaker, in a well earned retirement, would like to give lessons to front benchers. It could be a beginnings of a new career and very glorious, or even more glorious, career. Um, I've now lost my thread entirely. <laughs> They say they want me to sit down, so I'm going to. I'm a, we'll gratify the opposition. <laughs> Mr. Barry Sherman. Mr. Speaker, I came into the chamber today thinking I felt sorry for the Attorney General. But as he started, no, I did. No, Fair no, enough. No. But every word he has uttered, no shame today, Humility. no shame at all. Humility. The fact that this government cynically manipulated the prorogation to shut down this House so that it couldn't work as a democratic assembly. He knows that that is the truth. And to come here with these barristers' bluster to obfuscate the truth and for a man like him a party like this and a leader like this, this Prime Minister, to talk about morals and morality is a disgrace! I, uh, I'm not sure I could discern in that marshmallow of, of the rhetoric any actual question. But, but insofar there was a question, there's an answer. If the, if the honourable gentleman thinks that the government should no longer be governing, tell his leader to bring a motion of no confidence this afternoon. Yes. Tell his leader to agree to a simple one-line statute that fixes the election by a simple majority, and we would be delighted to meet him wherever he chooses in front of the electorate. Who will judge whether the machinations which he supports and the devices he resorts to in order to make sure this dead parliament continues are right or wrong. Antoinette Sandbach. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Attorney General speaks of moral and constitutional courage. Can he explain to this House why the government didn't have the moral and constitutional courage to find a wit file a witness statement in the Supreme Court attesting to the truth? of the position that was being outlined to the Supreme Court judges. Um, I, I can't, I'm afraid, make comments on matters that are plainly covered, not only by the Convention, but by legal professional privilege. But what I would say to, the, I, what I would say to my honourable friend is that the government's position was set out very clearly in argument, and if she follows it all, it went on for a very long time, and the Supreme Court decided against it. We accept that position. Mr Nicholas Edward Coleridge Bowles. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Having lost in court, uh, the Attorney General is keen to try his hand at another uh, test of an election, and maybe I can help him. In paragraph 41 of their unanimous judgment, the Supreme Court referred to two fundamental principles of our constitutional law, and I quote, the first is the principle of parliamentary sovereignty, that laws enacted by the Crown in Parliament are the supreme form of law in our legal system with which everyone, including the government, must comply. 
Yeah. And that is the end of the quote. <clears throat> Can the Attorney General confirm that he and the government will comply with the law known as the Ben Act, recently ah. passed by this Parliament, that has received royal assent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Steve Baker. Isn't it the case that, contrary to the shouted opinions of the front bench opposite, what the Supreme Court has done is to invent a new constitutional rule? Just as Lord, just as Lord Sumption told us on the Today programme this morning, and Lord Sumption also said that this was a revolution. He described the decision as revolutionary. So, isn't it the case that prior? It's, it, she shouts shocking. It's Lord Sumption who said it. Yes, Isn't it, it is. the case so, that prior to this revolutionary decision by the Supreme Court, it's quite likely, indeed probable, that his advice was entirely correct until the Supreme Court changed the law? I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for the, for the question. Um, I, I can't disclose what advice I gave. The honourable lady uh, who first asked this question uh, had that answer, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to keep giving it today. But what I would say um, is that the Supreme Court did indeed, as it overtly and explicitly said, develop the law. It took what was a political convention, hitherto in all of the constitutional textbooks, described as unenforceable by a court, and decided that it would set a test and make to convert it into a legal principle and a legal test. And that it was perfectly entitled to do, just as this House will, in the coming months and years, have to reflect upon the implications of it and whether it is content to leave that position untouched. But for the moment, it is the law, and the law must be obeyed. Stephen Doughty. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, can the Attorney-General be very, very clear? Were the Director of Legislative Affairs, Nicky de Costa, and the Cabinet Secretary, and indeed any other advisor, including the Leader of the House's Office, asked to make sworn statements in these cases, and did they refuse to do so, and if so, why? I, I simply cannot comment on matters that pertain to the internal preparations of cases which are covered by legal professional privilege. It's simply not reasonable to ask them to do so, it, it, particularly when it relates to individuals. So the, 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 the honourable gentleman should make no assumptions one way or the other from what I'm saying. The fact is they're covered by privilege and they must be respected. Mickey <laughs> Ford. There are many extremely distinguished and experienced lawyers in this House, but some of us are not lawyers, <coughs> and many of our constituents are not lawyers. So could my right honourable friend, the Attorney General, explain this very clearly? Is this a new law? Does it set a new precedent? And if it is a new law and a new precedent, will the government comply with the new law and comply with the new precedent? Um, it, it, what it is is a new principle of law which has been which has been found to exist by the Supreme Court um, and where hitherto it has not been thought that a court could go but that is the court is entitled to develop the common law and that it has done it does set a precedent it is binding unless this house in due course should consider it should take action to alter that position Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While yesterday's Supreme Court decision was extremely welcome, upholding parliamentary sovereignty, it should never have come to this. Our centuries old unwritten constitution, based on a gentlemen's agreements, is not fit for purpose when dangerous populists yep. are in office. Yep. Will he therefore consider urgent proposals for a written constitution yes. developed with real citizens' engagement, since our democracy belongs to all of us, not just those who think they're above the law? Yep. Well, I have to say I have a degree of sympathy with uh, what the Honourable Lady says. I do think that as we depart the European Union, 
Uh, there is ground for thinking again about our constitutional arrangements, how they should be ordered. And in doing so, I think a widespread public consultation of the kind she's describing would be essential, because any new constitutional arrangements uh, would have to be sanctioned by the widest possible public support and assent. So I do have some sympathy, and no doubt over the coming uh, months and years, this will be a subject of important concern to this House. Dr Julian Lewis. Given that three of the most distinguished lawyers in the country, including the Master of the Rolls and the Lord Chief Justice, found in the lower court that the government's case was entirely correct, can the Attorney General, enlightened, puzzled non-lawyers like me, as to why not even one out of 11 mm. Supreme Court judges could be found to agree with them. Mm. Well, um, I, I think my uh, honourable uh, friend is asking me to look there into a crystal ball. I, uh, far be it from me to fathom the inscrutable minds of their lordships in the Supreme Court as to why they chose to not to dissent if they were minded to dissent or to agree if they were minded not to agree. Chris Bryant. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, for one, am delighted that we are sitting. Um, but the Attorney General is absolutely right about one thing. The result of yesterday's ruling is that all future prorogations will be justiciable by the courts. The only answer to that, frankly, is legislation by this House. My gentle suggestion is that it might be a good idea if prorogation in the future were only allowed to proceed if there had been a vote in this House in favour of it. Yeah. Well, that is obvious. If I may say to uh, the Honourable Gentleman, that is, as I would expect from him, particularly in his new guise, um, as, uh, as a, an aspirant to even higher office, a constructive, helpful, impartial and a model to us all. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I think, but I'm not sure, that the Attorney General is seeking to help the Honourable Gentleman. <laughs> uh, Charlie Elphick. Mr Speaker, can I ask the Attorney General um, that in applying this new legal principle that has been created or invented by the Supreme Court, how many prorogations in the last century would have passed muster to the test that has been created? How can this longest session that this House has had since the Civil War now be lawfully brought to an end and a Queen's speech lawfully brought forward? And finally, is royal assent a proceeding in Parliament? Um. As to my honourable friend's uh, first question, uh, plainly, if one re-examines the historical records, there is no doubt that there would have been some, possibly quite a few, prorogations that under this test might have had difficulty in passing. For example, Ramsay MacDonald uh, prorogued this Parliament in uh, 1930 for some months during the course of a minority government at a time when the Great Wall Street crash had happened in 1929 and when I've no doubt that some would say the House should have sat to determine the onset of the Great Depression and to debate those important matters. But the courts looked on. They looked on impassively as that Labour government uh, decided to prorogue and again in 1948, and right up into the 1990s, when it was said that a parliament had been prorogued in order to avoid an embarrassing select committee inquiry. And from now on, when a prime minister has to prorogue parliament, he'll have to look at all the select committees and see what inquiries they're doing and which chairman of which select committee might say in a mortally wounded and offended manner why to prorogue and not to allow my select committee to report is a matter of public importance which I'll go to court and stop the prorogation for. So I do think that this uh, test set by the Supreme Court invites quite a number of significant questions. I do. Luciana Berger. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Attorney General has told us that he doesn't agree with the judgment and that he argued against it. If that is the case, and the Attorney General is so convinced that prorogation was lawful, why didn't he and the government provide a witness statement to the Supreme Court to make that case? Absolutely right. Look, there are all kinds of reasons why, in judicial reviews, witness statements are not given in cases of this kind. And I cannot discuss the internal counsels of the preparations of a legal case because it is covered by an wholly appropriate, I'm sure she understands, legal professional privilege. Stevenson. Uh, given that Parliament is at the apex of our constitutional system, does the Attorney General believe that the appointment of Supreme Court judges should, be, should receive the formal approval of Parliament? No. Uh, I, 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 I understand uh, the question of my honourable friend, and I say to him quite frankly, I think that that is a matter which this House, in the coming months and years, may need to reflect upon depending upon how the constitutional arrangements of the Honourable Lady for Brighton, I, I, forgive me, Brighton and Hove, but for Brighton Pavilion, um, indicated. Because I do think that we are going to have to look again at our constitutional arrangements. And we should see if we could, for, if we could find some common ground on that. I mean, we need to have a proper consideration of it. As we leave the European Union, a great gap opens up uh, from where we take away from legal integration all of this European Union law and we need to think about the implications of that. So I agree that uh, one matter may very well be whether there will need to be parliamentary scrutiny of judicial appointments in some manner. I have to say that I'm not enthusiastic about it but I understand why my honourable friend asked. Pat McFadden. The attorney's defence today with regard to the Supreme Court judgment appears to be that because the government won the semi-final, they should have been awarded the trophy. <laughs> that is not how it works. And in the final, he should acknowledge that the government lost 11-0. <laughs> with regard to his call, which repeats the call from the Prime Minister, for the public to break the Brexit deadlock by casting their votes. If he's so keen for a public vote on Brexit, why does he not offer the public the chance to vote on the final government Brexit deal, yes, however exactly. that turns out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Because I'll tell him why. Because I think it would be an insult to the millions who voted in the first to have a second one before we'd implemented the first. Secondly, let, let, let me be, that's what I think. I know people disagree, but that's what, a legitimate point of view. But the second thing, I think, is this. The question now of this House is whether the government is going to be permitted to govern. If the opposition does not wish to allow it to govern, then its morally, its morally correct thing to do is to seek to have an election. What I object to here yeah. is that this party yeah. and this side of the House has repeatedly sought to block that and to prevent the electorate from having its say when this Parliament is as dead as dead can be. Mr Nigel Evans. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. And following uh, on from that, would the Attorney General accept that the vast majority of people I talk to have great faith in this government, but they have no faith in this Remain Parliament. And whilst there are important legal implications for yesterday's ruling, the practical implications of that ruling is that this Remain Parliament that has talked about Brexit for over three and a half years will now get several more weeks to do what they possibly can to talk about Brexit but make absolutely certain that 17.4 million people yeah, yeah, yeah. never get what they voted for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, 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 uh, I wholly understand the strength of feeling of my honourable friend, and I agree with almost all of it. <laughs> Catherine McKinnon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Attorney General accepts that his legal advice was wrong, that the government got this wrong, whether in law 
or not, it was patently obvious to everybody watching that it was wrong to prorogue Parliament in that way. The United Kingdom Head of State was asked by the Prime Minister to agree to an illegal course of action based on incorrect advice. What does he believe should be the consequences for those responsible? The same consequences that flow from any good faith implementation of advice that at the time is perfectly respectable and tenable advice, as this was. The fact of the matter is that the government's position was that the, law, the prorogation was lawful and it was constitutional. Now, that was the advice that the government had. It was the advice that it gave uh, to those who, uh, who asked it. And the Supreme Court has decided we're wrong. We accept that, as I've been asked. And respectable point of view. Dr. Caroline Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My constituents in Sleaford and North Highcombe voted to leave the European Union, and many of them have written to me since yesterday's judgment, concerned about that, whether that will be delivered. Can, the, can my right honourable friend, the Attorney General, confirm there is nothing in this judgment that will prevent us from leaving the EU on the 31st of October, as they voted for in the referendum? I think there is nothing in this judgment that applies directly to the question of our departure to the European Union. So, as uh, the justices made clear, this was a decision solely on the lawfulness of the prorogation. Uh, Mr Speaker, further to the question by my honourable friend, the member for Grantham and Stamford, has the government been seeking a route not to comply with the Benn Act, as several ministers have made clear, and has he been asked to offer legal advice to that effect? I, I, I can't answer the last question, as he well knows. As, as, as attorneys general, as attorneys general have long maintained the convention, we cannot disclose either the fact or content of any advice. But I will deal with the first point. There's no question. There's no question of this government not obeying the law. There is a question as to precisely what obligations the law might require of the government, but once those obligations are ascertained with clarity, and I'm not saying that they aren't clear, I'm just saying that it's a legitimate consideration the government must go through, the government will obey them. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, set alongside the decision of the Supreme Court, what force in law does the decision of the British people to leave the European Union have? Uh, yeah. um, the, the law, the law um, in relation to the referendum is that it was not binding upon this Parliament. It was binding in every moral sense upon those who promised the British people that it, it would be implemented, but it was not binding as a matter of law. Deirdre Brock. Attorney General excuses recent comments by members of this House as simply the expression of robust critical views. But wouldn't you agree that, in fact, those who are arguing recently that Brexit would give back control to the UK courts and the UK Parliament have now completely U-turned and are actively working yeah. to undermine those yeah. institutions? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I, I think that's a ridiculous assertion, in fact. <laughs> I mean, the reality, the reality is that what we who believe in leaving the European Union have fought so long for is to return to the United Kingdom the power to chart its own course ungoverned by unelected or other institutions in the European Union. Now, how we arrange our constitutional arrangements is a matter for us, and it should be a matter for us. It should be a matter for the democratic assent of all the peoples of the United Kingdom. So, so I don't believe for a moment that this government or this, uh, this uh, uh, side of the House is trying in any way to avoid that. What we're trying to do is make sure those powers come back to the British people where they should reside. Yes. Yes. 
Andrew Bridgen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my right honourable and learned friend agree with me that, contrary to the repeated claims of the Prime Minister's many political opponents, that the moment he announced prorogation he broke the law, the fact is he did not? Because, as we all know now, the Supreme Court judgment yesterday set new law. The Supreme Court judgment said that the government got the law wrong. We have to accept that, but it is perfectly true that in doing so, they effectively uh, invented or created a new legal principle, which hitherto had been a political convention, and defined that principle in a new legal test. Um, it's a crystal ball gazing to know whether any court would decide to do that. It did, though the court below, led by the Lord Chief Justice, concluded that it should not. Ian Murray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. During the Attorney-General's theatrical rant earlier, he inadvertently forgot to answer the question from my right honourable friend, the member for Dellen. How much has this prorogation yes, cost the taxpayer and all the legal advice and all the legal consequences answer. cost the UK taxpayer? Answer. Well, I, I, I don't know is the answer to that question, um, but I'm sure if the uh, honourable gentleman wants to know, you can put down, he can put down a written question, um, uh, or I'm, I'm happy to write to him if you like. And I'm, very happy, I'm very happy to disclose that uh, in due course once the costs are known, but I may say to the Honourable gentlemen, all those costs could have been saved if he just voted for an election. Yeah. We could have avoided these, these cascades of cash falling upon so many lawyers in so many jurisdictions by the simple act of him having the moral guts and not being chicken, which is what they are. <laughs> Gerald Gillard. On, on the subject of taxation, could my right honourable and learned friend advise me these legal actions, I believe, have been part funded by crowdfunding. Uh, will that funding be taxable, and will the tax payable on that crowdfunding have to be paid by the individuals bringing the cases? Oh. <laughs> I, 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 I don't believe they're taxable, but I have to say to my right honourable and learned friend that I would need to, um, if she would permit me to look into it, and if she wishes, I'll certainly write to her on the subject. Helen Goodman. Earlier this morning, the Attorney General set out again his long held views about why publishing his advice is not a good idea. So, has he requested a leak inquiry to discover who gave documents to Sky News last night? And if he hasn't, is that because he's worried it'll unmask machinations in number 10? They aren't just my long standing views, as I know the Honourable Lady will accept. They are the long standing views of successive attorneys of all governments over many, many years. As to the second question she asks, I am not aware whether there is a, or isn't a leak inquiry, but these days I'm so used to the porousness of government that, frankly, I use Cabinet these days to advertise whenever I need to some, uh, my, uh, some particular uh, cause that I want to espouse. The reality is that this government, this parliament, is in a position where we need to go to the electorate, and I would urge her to support that as soon as possible, because it is the only morally right thing to do to subject these debates to the public again. Amber Rudd. Mr Speaker, I must raise my concerns about the Attorney General constantly saying that this Parliament is dead. This Parliament was elected in 2017. It reflects the divisions in this country, the divisions in our communities and the divisions in our families. The failure is that we have not yet reached a compromise. Many of us long to leave the European Union, as we set out in the referendum, but are frustrated by the fact that we have not been able to find a consensus amongst the different factions. Can I urge the Attorney General to work with colleagues to try and find that compromise and to cease this language? of pitting Parliament against the people. I, I, I assure my right honourable friend that if I hadn't been driven to this language, I would never have used it. The fact is... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The, the fact of the matter is 
that the opposition won't let the government govern. Yeah. The opposition won't do what the opposition should do in these circumstances, which is vote for an election. By any standards, the government is in a minority. It's having the order paper taken over from it again and again, and no doubt further attempts to come. And that is the very definition of a parliament that won't fulfil its responsibilities, either to let the Queen's government to be able to be conducted or to opt for a general election. That is why I call this a dead parliament, and I do so advisedly. And I know my right honourable friend knows. Nobody worked harder than I for compromise. Nobody. Nobody worked harder than I did for compromise. Nobody worked harder than I did to put through the withdrawal agreement that was put before this House. I and she worked hard to put this through, but I've now reached a sad and heavy conclusion that this Parliament's no longer worth sitting or worth the candle, and it should be gone for any good it's doing. Dr. Philip Lee. Yes. Honourable and learned gentlemen, the, the approach today probably should have had more humility and less levity. Yeah. Because there is widespread sympathy for the difficulty, position, the difficulty of his position offering legal advice in such cha challenging circumstances. In view of the fact that his advice on prorogation has been found to be unlawful and building on questions previously, can he answer to the House whether he has been asked by the Prime Minister to proffer advice on the legality and whether it would be lawful to ignore the instruction of the Ben Act? Whether he has offered advice or not is not subject to privilege. Words fail me, Mr. Speaker. I really <laughs> the right honourable gentleman arises, arises in the full force of his morality, <laughs> having been elected for one party and sitting there for another. <laughs> his honourable friend, his honourable friend, who did the, rat, the chicken run, the rat run before him, having said already that she thinks there should be a by-election when people change their parties, he has the nerve to arise and suggest somehow that I should have affected greater humility. I think he should be on his knees to his own constituents, on his knees to his own constituents, begging their forgiveness for his betrayal. The fact of the matter is, the question is subject to the law officer's convention as he knows, and I cannot answer him. But I would suggest that when he's back here re-elected by his constituents, as no doubt he has a confidence that he will be, ask me then, and I, maybe I'll give him an answer outside. <laughs> Jeremy Lefroy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my right honourable and learned friend agree with me that if Her Majesty's Government chooses to push its prerogative powers to the limit, as indeed it is quite entitled to do, if perhaps not necessarily well advised to do, that it should both expect the challenge that it has had and perhaps the conclusion that's arisen from that. Um, I didn't hear a word of that. I'm very sorry, and I'd be most grateful. Uh, there are very unattractive. Yeah, no, no, there was a very unattractive rant fest taking place between honourable members on opposite sides of the House, each gesticulating aggressively at each other. It's a very undesirable state of affairs. Let's have a bit of calm. Let's have the question again and the answer. But we want to proceed fairly quickly. Mr Lefroy. Hear me again, Mr Speaker. Yeah. It's not, not normally you're, you're most generous. But would my right honourable and learned friend agree with me that if Her Majesty's Government wishes to push its uh, prerogative powers to the very limits, which it is quite entitled to do, if perhaps not always well advised to do, that the kind of consequences we've seen in the last few days are inevitable. I think that in any situation where constitutional powers are pushed to their limits, it's bound to cause strain. And I completely accept 
that we are in an unprecedented time now when constitutional limits are being pressed on all sides in this House by seizing control of order papers, by rejecting the opportunity for elections when they won't let the government govern. These are, these are factors that place huge strain yep. upon our constitutional arrangements. And I agree with him that uh, it would be a good thing if we could resume calmer waters, which no doubt we will, because I have every faith and confidence in the good sense of this country and in the end the good sense of this House to be able to come to a solution and that solution must be, I believe, a general election. Order. A number of honourable right of members are standing to contribute who were not standing at the start of the statement. That of itself is perfectly reasonable, and I will seek to accommodate them if a thought has occurred to them that they want to convey or the question that they want to put would otherwise go unasked. But once those who are standing have asked their questions pithily, we must move on to the next urgent question. Clive Efford. Mr Speaker. The... Attorney General has really tried to take the high moral ground on this, but I have to wonder what morals were applied by the government that led to yesterday's Supreme Court decision. So can he tell the House, when was it that he first became aware that the advice that was given to Her Majesty the Queen, to the Speaker of this House, and this House itself, about the reasons for prorogation, and that those reasons were not true? That, if I may say so, is what we used to call in advocacy terms a when did you stop beating your wife question. <laughs> the reality is I don't accept the premise of the question. Uh, there, there is no question that uh, the Supreme Court found in any way that any advice that had been given that was consciously or knowing misleading. Uh, on Whittingdale. Would my right friend agree that there is a judgment which is superior to that of any courts? And that is the judgment of the British people, yeah, yeah, yeah. which has once been given on the question of whether or not this country should remain a member of the European Union, but has twice been prevented from being expressed in a vote of this House. And is it not now time that we should allow them to give their judgment on this Parliament? Uh, Mr Speaker, I couldn't agree with more than my right honourable friend. The time has come. We are the fact is this Parliament has no further point. There's no possibility of us governing while this Parliament continues to block everything it does. In brevity now required single sentence questions, please, without preamble. Lady Herman. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. I've listened very carefully to the Attorney General, I haven't agreed with a fraction of what he has said. But I would like the Attorney General to answer a specific question. Did it never cross his mind that if the Prime Minister made a ridiculous decision to prorogue Parliament for five weeks in the run up to Brexit, which is the greatest constitutional change to the UK for years, that the courts would rule that to be an unlawful prorogation of Parliament? If, if, I, General, if I were to answer that question, tempting though it is particularly from my honourable, I was going to say my honourable friend, the honourable lady, but she's a friend as well, um, I, would, uh, I would be, uh, be transgressing the Law Officers' Convention uh, because I would be telling her what advice I had or hadn't given. But if she asks me, if she asks me, did it occur to me? Well, of course it did. Of course it occurred to me. Any barrister who enters into litigation, if it doesn't occur to him that he might lose, is a bit of a nit, isn't he? I mean, really. Of course it occurred to me we might lose. Uh, 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 but uh, the reality is it would be ridiculous not to. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Attorney General agree with the views of the overwhelming majority of my constituents in Gillingham and Rainham that the continued delay in delivering on the result of the referendum by the 31st of October is leading to the public having a lack of confidence in our democratic process? And the only way to resolve that is to have that election now and let the public decide. Oh. I completely agree with the Honourable Gentleman. He's put his finger right on it. It is this continuing artificial prolongation of this dead parliament is undermining people's confidence. I know, I know why they're not doing it, because they know they won't survive. But they've got to have the courage of their convictions and get on with it and put it to the country. Rachel Maskell. The Attorney General is trying to exonerate his and his government's determinations by saying that the Supreme Court that the Supreme Court um, 
created new laws, something he said at the dispatch box. Isn't it the role and wasn't it the action of the Supreme Court to, to interpret existing law? Uh, yeah. well, that is, of course, one function of what a court's role is, but a court is perfectly entitled to develop the common law. And I don't think there could be any doubt that that's what happened in this case. Martin Whitfield. Grateful, Mr. Yeah, yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. It's often said that a lawyer who acts for himself has a fool for a client. And it's also worrying if the lawyer does not, is not aware of the costs of the case in continuing with the advice. <laughs> so could the Attorney General, when he makes a statement about the costs to the taxpayer, include the costs of, to the House Authority of having to reconvene on 24 hours' notice and the inconvenience to the staff here? Well, General. I may say so, Mr. Speaker. May I place on record my endorsement entirely for your expression of gratitude to the staff of the House? They do an extraordinarily great job, and we are deeply grateful to them and grateful for the speed with which they've been able to facilitate the resumption of Parliament. Angela Smith. Mr. Speaker, the question of who had sight of the legal advice before the decision was taken remains unanswered. So I ask the Attorney General once again, did the Cabinet have sight of the legal advice and did the Prime Minister's Chief Advisor, Dominic Cummings, have sight of the legal advice? Um, Attorney General. The, the, the Honourable Lady will know that I cannot disclose whether I gave advice or the content of any such advice. It is covered by the Law Officers Convention. The question is, did, was the advice shown presumes that there was advice. So it simply contradicts the law as convention. I wish I could answer a question, but I can't. Wayne David. Following yesterday's Supreme Court judgment, the Prime Minister presumably got in touch with Buckingham Palace and Ephidus offered his apology to Her Majesty the Queen for giving unlawful advice. Yeah, yeah. My question is, did the Attorney General speak to the Prime Minister before the conversation took place? I, well, I, 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 I didn't, no. <laughs> Stuart C. Macdonald. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I wonder, would he agree with me that any reasonable Attorney General acting with due care would it query, would challenge and perhaps even laugh at any suggestion that five weeks of prorogation was necessary in order to prepare for a Queen's speech? Yeah. 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 General. Um, I, 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 I think I understood the Honourable uh, Justice, but I don't agree with its premise, no. Geraint Davis. The attorney has accepted the Supreme Court's judgment that the government acted illegally in closing down democracy, but will he accept his duty, his fundamental duty, to uphold the rule of law and democracy and not fan the flames of hatred uh, with the people against the courts, the people against democracy, on the road to fascism, as he appears to be doing today by making fun of the Supreme Court and saying they're making things up as they go along? We make the law, they interpret the law, and he and all of us should obey the law. General. The Honourable Gentleman really needs to listen more closely to what I say. The, the Supreme Court was perfectly entitled to reach the view it did. It did so by reasoned, uh, reasoned decision making. It was uh, entirely within the scope of its jurisdiction. But there's no question that it developed the common law in doing so. That's all I've said, and that's what courts often do. Sam Jima. Mr Speaker, it is not fear of the electorate that drives some of us in this House. It is our determination to do the right thing by our constituents and the country against a government that is determined to deliver Brexit at any price. Yeah. Mr Speaker, you've had government ministers saying today that somehow the judgment that has been handed down by the Supreme Court is not, could be disputed by other parties but they never say which aspects of the, it they disagree with and on what basis. Could the Attorney General let us know when ministers cast doubt on this judgment what exactly they disagree with and why they are doing that in public? Attorney well, General. The, the uh, Honourable Gentleman asks me about why ministers might contest parts of the judgment. There's nothing wrong with the 
government or the honourable gentleman or any other member of the public <laughs> to seeking to argue that parts of the judgment were either mistaken or poorly reasoned. I don't would necessarily agree with that, but, but there's no harm in people doing it because that is part of democratic debate. What is wrong and what I deplore and what I urge all members of this House not to do is to impugn the motives of those who make the decisions. Because these are in fine judges who reach their decisions impartially on what they think is the best view of the law. And I have no doubt that is what the Supreme Court did in this case. But I'm not, if I may, going to go into all the areas of the judgment that are fragile or vulnerable to alternative arguments. The arguments of the government were set out in writing. The judgment of the Lord Chief Justice in the Divisional Court was brilliantly reasoned, uh, was in the government's view entirely right, uh, but the Supreme Court chose to disagree with it. Peter Grant. Thank you, Thank you Mr Speaker. Despite the repeated denials from the Prime Minister, it has been obvious from the angry reaction of Brexiteers in the last 24 hours that this attempted prorogation was about Brexit yes. and nothing yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Isn't the real reason why no do would testify under oath as to what the government's reasons were, was that even in the government, nobody believed that the Prime Minister's reasons were the truth? Yeah. <laughs> if, if the Prime Minister had wished to prevent this House from debating Brexit, yeah. he would have prorogued it from the 5th of September to the 14th of October. Because he allowed, even we knew, does, the, does it seriously suggest that the government was, was blind to the possibility that in the first few days of resumption after the 4th of September, that it was not possible that exactly what happened would happen? If we'd wished to close down all debate and prevent the option of legislation, which was ultimately taken by this House with the consent of Mr Speaker, we could have prorogued it from the 5th, but we didn't. There was, and furthermore, on the 14th of October, there would have been two and a half more weeks for this House to act. With respect to all this talk about a coup is just nonsense. Inflamed political tripe, invented and inflated, so that this gang can justify clinging to their green benches for another few undeserved weeks. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Ian C. Luca. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The authors of this failed political trick, the Prime Minister and Dominic Cummings, have fallen in treating Parliament with contempt. What is truly contemptible and what is cowardly is Dominic Cummings refusing to give evidence to a select committee and being in contempt of Parliament and now hiding behind the skirts of the Prime Minister, which is who is supporting an individual who is working for the government in not giving evidence to a select committee. Does the Attorney General think that is a respectable position? I'm not sure it's a question General. for the Attorney General. I'm sure the Honourable, well, the Honourable Gentleman can find, can find somebody who's uh, able to deal with it better than I. But what I would say is that uh, attacking people who can't answer for themselves in this House is not, is not appropriate, and I wouldn't myself choose to do it. Alan Brown. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Attorney General explain why there is a lack of signed witness statements, or is it the case that we all know the civil servants couldn't defend indefensible and they thought the government was at it all along? Yeah, yeah. Well, as I've said in the past, Mr Speaker, I, I can't answer questions about witness statements or the internal preparations of the government's case for this uh, Supreme Court. Alex Norris. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the attorney says that this parliament doesn't want to do any work, does not wish to legislate. He is wrong. There are very, very many very important issues that we are desperate to legislate on, none more important than the domestic abuse bill that members across this place and the other place have worked together on for two years now and could easily come before this place, get this into law and make this and improve the lives of tens of thousands across the country. Will the attorney put aside his confected outrage and speak to his honourable friend, the Leader of the House, and ask him to schedule tomorrow and next week the important stages of this crucial bill? Yeah. Uh, I, I certainly will talk to the Chief Whip about it if, 
If, uh, if, the, uh, if there's a consent on all sides for this house, we might as well do something while we're waiting for them to make up their minds to go for an election. Patricia Gibson. Mr. Speaker, the Queen has been misled, the law has been broken, and Scotland's Supreme Court has ruled that the Prime Minister has been less than honest. Yeah, Yet yeah. there is not a hint of humility yep, from yep. the benches opposite. Yep. What sanctions does the Attorney General think the Prime Minister is playing fast and loose with our democratic institutions merits? And is the Attorney General seriously coming before us today to tell us that the Prime Minister's position is terrible? Is it not the case that the decent thing for the Prime Minister to do is go? Well, I, I, can I encourage her then to ensure that we vote for the election motion that will be coming before the House shortly? That way you can, he, she can ensure that what she hopes, she thinks, no doubt, will take place. But the reality is, no, I don't agree. The Supreme Court found no impropriety on behalf of the government, the Prime Minister, or anybody else. Ian Paisley. Mr Speaker, does the Attorney-General believe that the judgment has left 17.5 million people feeling more disenfranchised than they've ever been? And how should the government and this House repair that damage? I completely agree. I completely agree. The actions of this House are bringing it into discredit. It is abandoning almost all reasonable precedent. The time has come for a general election, and to resist it is immoral, unparliamentary, and undemocratic. But that is a decision. That is a decision this uh, opposition has taken. Let us wait and see what the electorate make of it. But I hope that they will understand that what this government is doing is trying to fulfil the mandate of those 17.4 million people. And we will never cease until we succeed. Andrew Hendry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is reassuring to see we are indeed carrying on where we left off. <laughs> As a senior lawyer himself, will the Attorney General agree with me that any attempts to describe the considered unanimous and unambiguous decision of the Supreme Court as a constitutional coup or nothing more than constitutional bull. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I could adopt that language in a parliamentary way. Uh, but um, it, it, this was a legitimate, perfectly reasonable, proper decision of the Supreme Court we should be proud of our judiciary, yeah. proud of its independence in all jurisdictions. I apply that to the inner house, the yeah. outer house, yeah. the divisional court. Lawyers will disagree on some of these complex and fundamental principles, and that is what has happened here. Order. And if the point of order relates to the matter of which we've just treated, that is to say this statement, then I will... <laughs> at my discretion, take it. Point of order, Emma Hardy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. During that uh, question and answer session, the Attorney General made a joke about the phrase, when did you last stop beating your yeah, wife? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, part of the reason people are so upset about the prorogation is because the domestic violence bill has fallen, as my honourable friend has just mentioned. Mr Speaker, can I seek your advice on how maybe the Attorney General can learn to moderate yeah. his language yeah. and not make jokes yeah. about domestic yeah. violence? Yeah. Well, it's open to the Attorney to respond if he so wishes, although he's not obliged to do so. Very briefly, the Attorney. Let me say, if I give an offence, I certainly didn't mean to. It's an old saying at the bar, which, which is... Which... No, 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 listen. Which is simply relates to a cross-examination technique of asking a question that presumes the premise. And it's the way in which we were taught. If I have given offence, I apologise. I thank the attorney for responding. This is a matter of extreme sensitivity. And what I would say to the Honourable Lady and more widely to the House is that it is incredibly important that we are sensitive to the wider implications and interpretation of what we say. And the mores of society do change, and sometimes one can find that things that one has quite freely said in the past, without causing offence, 
can no longer be said without causing offence. But each member must make his or her own judgment. The attorney made his, and the attorney has said what he has said, and I thank him for that. A point of order, Craig McKinley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I apologise for not giving advance notice for this, but it's advice that I think is very relevant to this debate. Uh, we have heard much of how the Supreme Court has extended its remit into the actions of the executive uh, and how that may play out into the future. I wondered if you could give advice, perhaps to your successor, whether the actions and decisions of the Speaker of this House yeah, yeah. should be similarly sub subject to judicial review yeah, yeah. and how that may work into the future. I'm extraordinarily grateful to the Honourable Gentleman, but as an attempted point of order, frankly, in old-fashioned O-level terms, with which I'm familiar and of which the Honourable Gentleman is probably aware, that would get an unqualified. <laughs> I'm afraid. It, it, it wasn't even a good try. I don't bear any ill will to the honourable gentleman, but if people are going to have a go at these things, the degree of nuanced subtlety and ingenuity would at least command respect. But there is a grade, and I'm afraid it was way, way, way below the grade. Yes, OK, I'll, a point of order, if it's on these matters but not beyond. A point of order, Hannah Bardell. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and apologies I did not give you advance notice. During the exchange just before, the Attorney-General said this Parliament is a dead Parliament, and he said it repeatedly, and it should no longer sit, it has no moral right to sit on these green benches. Mr Speaker, can you advise me how we can ensure that the Attorney General makes a statement, retracts those words, because they are beneath him, they are beneath this place. I was sent here by the people of Livingston and Scotland, as were my colleagues sent by their constituents, and our position should not be undermined by, frankly, such flippant and ridiculous language. There is an important issue here. Is something that causes offence required to be withdrawn? The answer to that, I must say in all candour to the Honourable Lady, whose sincerity I respect, is no. Lots of things are said that may cause offence or provoke umbrage and about which there will be dispute, but there was nothing disorderly about what the attorney said. The Honourable Lady has registered her view with considerable force and alacrity and it will be on the record for her constituents to observe. No impropriety has taken place. And I think we can now proceed to the urgent question, Leila Moran. Thank you, Mr Speaker. To ask the Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport if she will make a statement on payments made by her department to Hacker House and on how her department manages possible conflicts of interest. I thank... Thank you, Mr Jeffrey, very much indeed. Minister Matt Warman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I thank the Honourable Lady for raising this question today, and I am answering it because it is my portfolio. Um, as honourable members may be aware, my department runs a programme known as the Cyber Security Immediate Impact Fund. The fund is one of a range of programmes, Mr Speaker, designed to increase the number and diversity of people who are pursuing careers in the cyber security profession. And through the fund, we want to support new creative and innovative projects that are delivered by a range of organisations, including start-ups and SMEs. We have supported a variety of initiatives awarding grants of between £20,000 and £500,000 since March 2018. Hacker House is one of the businesses that was awarded a £100,000 grant in February 2019 as part of our second funding round. To date, they have been paid some £47,000 for work completed. This is a grant that was awarded uh, by officials from DCMS, by the Department for Education, by Tech UK, and indeed by people from the National Cyber Security Centre. And if she wishes to uh, impugn the motives of those officials, I would invite her to think very carefully before she does so. To date, we have awarded 11 companies to deliver 12 Initiatives. Over 400 people, Mr Speaker, have benefited from support through this fund, and our objective is that even more people will benefit as the businesses with whom we partner further invest in a sector that I know she agrees is vital to the future of our security and our economy. 
This is part of our mission as a department to identify untapped talent and to help a broader range of individuals who have the capabilities and aptitude to develop their careers in cyber security. And I would like to assure the House that all grants are awarded through an open, transparent and competitive process, Mr Speaker. Each grant is judged on specific assessment criteria and is approved by the panel I referred to earlier with cross-departmental and industry representation. We are, of course, aware of the claims raised recently by the Sunday Times, and the Department is reviewing the decision that was taken, but we monitor all initiatives that have been awarded grant funding, Mr Speaker, and we treat any allegations of impropriety with the utmost seriousness. And as soon as I have any further information to share on this matter, I will, of course, update the House at the earliest possible opportunity. I thank the Minister for his reply. I should make it clear, I care very little about the personal life of the Prime Minister, but I care a lot about how this government manages conflicts of interest and how it spends taxpayers' money. And on that basis, I am concerned that the Department appears to have given Hacker House a £100,000 grant in January 2019 as part of the Cyber Skills Immediate Impact Fund, a grant that was open to initiatives based in and that operate from Britain, and that furthermore, these grants should not exceed 50% of the company's revenue. We now know that Hacker House is not based in the UK. The Sunday Times reports that its owner, Jennifer Arcuri, moved back to the USA in June 2018. These grants weren't open for application until November. The registered address of the company is, in fact, a house in Cheshire, where she used to rent, and the current occupant apparently sends any post addressed to Miss Arcuri back to sender. <laughs> Mr Speaker, where is the due diligence? What steps did the department take to ensure that Hacker House was indeed based in and operating in the UK? Why did officials waive the rule that the grant could not exceed 50% of the company's collective income? And I ask how many of the other 11 companies that we now found have had these grants have had this kind of preferential treatment? And did the Prime Minister, then the backbencher, right honourable member for Uxbridge, did he make any representations, official or otherwise, to the department recommending Hacker House for this funding? The department says that it will investigate the award of the grant, but will the minister tell us when will this review conclude and will it be made fully public? But the misuse of public funds and conflicts of interest in relation to Ms Arcuri run deeper than just this matter. Mr Speaker, I appreciate that the Minister will not be able to speak for the actions of the Prime Minister when he was the Mayor of London, but would he, on behalf of the Government and the Prime Minister, ensure that all departments will fully cooperate with the investigation being launched by the London's Assembly's o- uh, London Assembly Oversight Committee into how the Mayor's Office handled conflicts of interest. Mr Speaker, the fact that we are back in the Commons today is because the Prime Minister has been shown to ride roughshod over the laws of this land. It would indeed be disappointing if we were to find that the Prime Minister has form in bending the rules for personal or political gain. Minister. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to start by saying that the Prime Minister and his staff have had absolutely no role in the award of this grant. And I suspect I will be saying that a number of times, but it will remain the case. In answer to the other questions uh, that she has raised, uh, the uh, review will be reporting by the end of next month, and I have said that I will update the House where necessary. Of course, we will fully cooperate with any other inquiry. She raises the matter of uh, the uh, match funding or the 50%. Uh, the uh, officials involved in awarding these grants uh, scored the, uh, this particular application very highly in all other aspects. Uh, on that aspect, as they routinely do in a number of other uh, situations, then they decided that the other aspects more than outweighed that particular individual criteria. Um, and on the question of where the company is based, uh, the officials have done the usual due diligence on 
from this company. She herself mentioned the address where it is based. It will, of course, be a part of the review that we are doing. But, as I say, this is a company that is based in Britain as far as Companies House is concerned. It is a company with a British phone number. We will review that, but we have no reason to think... We have, we, we, we have no reason to think that there is anything untoward in this particular matter. And uh, to, 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 to just finally address the, uh, the, the range of issues that she raised at the end of her question, if she wants to raise matters about a grant that was awarded uh, by officials through the proper process, then this is, of course, a completely legitimate forum. If she wants to use this to try and spread tittle-tattle that is much more around politics, then I would say that she should think very carefully before doing that. Damien Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome what the Minister said about the review being conducted in the Department. He'll know that the Secretary of State is due to give evidence to the DCMS Select Committee on the 16th of October. Could I ask whether, whether he or the Secretary of State could write to the Select Committee before then with an update on the terms of reference the, for the review, any results from the review so far, and also details of other, uh, other awards made to other companies and how much was given under the same scheme? Minister. I, I, I thank the Chair of the Select Committee for that question. Um, that my right honourable friend assures me that we are more than happy to uh, write to his committee. Uh, and, of course, uh, the, uh, the awards that were made to other companies, um, th these are no secret. There was a press release put out about uh, these things. We are, of course, happy to provide his committee with more details of that. Tom Watson. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I would like to welcome the Minister to his new role. Uh, and thank the member for Oxford Western, uh, Oxford Western Abingdon for her forensic questioning this morning. Now, this company, Hacker House, got the grant of £100,000. I've looked at the stated aim of this fund. It says, increasing the diversity and numbers of those working in the UK's booming cyber security sector and to develop a sustainable supply of homegrown cyber security talent. As I understand it, Hacker House is a company headquarters in, headquartered in California and the principal owners of the company live in the United States. The company claims to have employees in London but refuses to reveal who they are or where they are. It is very difficult to see how the company fulfilled the criteria for these grants. So will the Secretary of State explain to us how Hacker House met the criteria of these grants, was the connection uh, with the then Foreign Secretary or any other MP in this House declared when the application was made? Will all applications and paperwork re relating to Hacker House, uh, the Hacker House grant, now be published in the library or be made available for public scrutiny? Did, did any MPs lobby on behalf of this company in regard to this or other grants granted by government departments. The broader questions that he has alluded to need answering in this case because they keep coming back to the current Prime Minister. The issue of whether he has represented the interests of this company or other companies require scrutiny, as the chair of the DCMS Select Committee has alluded to. This is fundamentally a question of character and of suitability. Is the Prime Minister of sufficient character to occupy high office and disperse public funds? Yeah. Is he suitable? Does he understand that the trappings and privileges of power come with restrictions and restraints? Is he capable of restraining himself? <laughs> the truth is that our Prime Minister does reckless things. He is a man whose character renders him unsuitable and unfit for the office he holds. I want answers to these questions, but we all know the broader, essential truth. We can all see who Boris Johnson is. Minister. Well, the uh, honourable member uh, said it was a pleasure to see me in my place. It's a pleasure to see him still in his, uh, although I'm not sure how many of his uh, honourable friends share that view. Um, I am, of course, uh, happy to repeat 
what I said before. The Prime Minister has had no role whatsoever in this application, and it is, I think, important to bear in mind that this is a decision made by officials, including people from the National Cyber Security Centre, including people from the DfE, from DCMS as well. These are honourable people doing the right thing, and they, are, they should not be. Their reputation should not be impugned in the way that he seeks to do so. Um, was there any lobbying? I have said no, there was not, either from the Prime Minister or from any other uh, member of Parliament. The uh, bid uh, that was submitted uh, in the first place uh, from Hacker House, uh, I, I have it here. Uh, we will seek uh, to make it public when there, so long as there are no commercial uh, sensitivities. Uh, the aim of the Cyber Security Immediate Impact Fund, uh, Cyber Skills Immediate Impact Fund, I beg his pardon, um, is to try and build our strength and depth in what is, I know he agrees, an absolutely vital area. The Hacker House bid, it seeks to train people and indeed build a platform uh, to train more people. That platform has already been built. He can go and check it out online himself. He could even sign up. Um, but uh, it is something that we will seek to uh, make sure reaches hundreds of people. That is part of the bid. It is an important part of this country's national uh, cyber security strategy. I would hope that he would support it rather than uh, raise a whole host of issues that are frankly not relevant to this question. James. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I must congratulate my honourable friends um, on the assumption of his office. Um, I quite agree that the cyber security impact skills fund is a crucial driver of Britain upweighting its skills in this vital area and growing area. Um, and I would like to commend the DCMS officials and those at the National Cyber Security Centre who have managed this fund. Um, I would, however, ask him to look closely at the performance of the fund in relation to the grant given to Hacker House in light of the information shared with the House this afternoon by the Honourable Member for Oxford West and Abingdon. I do think close scrutiny of what they are doing with this money is of paramount importance. Uh, I, 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 thank, I thank the uh, Honourable Lady for her question. I pay tribute to uh, her work uh, as, as my predecessor. It is an honour to follow her uh, at this dispatch box. Uh, and she is, of course, completely right. She will know uh, that we, as a department, routinely uh, talk to uh, those who are in receipt of grants uh, and that uh, we make sure that there is uh, as much oversight as there possibly can be. That process, of course, will continue. Uh, and as uh, I, I've said, there is a review going on into this particular uh, grant so that we can make sure it delivers maximum value for money for the taxpayer. Anna Bardell. Mr Speaker, and I also welcome the Minister to his place. I wonder when he was discussing the acceptance of his job, he knew he would be doing the PM's bidding and cleaning up his mess. And Mr Speaker, I, I think it's fair to pay tribute and thanks to the bravery and determination of those who fought through the courts to ensure that we are back here today and able to hold this government to account. My honourable and learned friend Fred in the South West, Gina Miller and Joe Mom of the Good Law Project, we thank and salute them. Because the blame and bluster that has come out of this government over this issue and the matter of what happened in the Supreme Court is frankly outrageous. The Prime Minister is under significant pressure to declare what interests he had and the relationship he had with uh, Jennifer Arcuri. And there is no disputing that the work is important, and, and I agree with the Minister on that point. But when he talks about other members impugning her character, the reality is it's the Prime Minister who is impugning her character yeah. because of the lack of transparency yeah, yeah. and the unwillingness to answer questions right. on that relationship. Now, he will be aware that uh, Hacker House received £100,000 from the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, and already members have raised the matter of where that business is domiciled. So will he tell us, uh, in, in those discussions and in that process, does he think it's appropriate that, given the huge amount of public money that has been spent, that his department is investigating itself? I would suggest that that's highly inappropriate, that there should be an end of the oh, 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 oh. I'm extremely grateful to the Honourable Lady. I'm afraid she's exceeded her time by 50% already, so that's the end of that, I'm afraid.
But, Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I, 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 I'm glad that the Honourable Lady welcomes the importance of this matter. I would say that this, uh, like all uh, government uh, grant-giving processes, is conducted uh, in a transparent uh, way. Uh, I, would, I would also uh, say that this uh, review will not be the department marking uh, its own homework. Uh, and as I say, we will be putting, that, uh, into, we will be putting uh, any further updates uh, to the House uh, as uh, they become available, which will be by the end of next month. Stephen Cave. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I understand that Ms. Arcuri's mother has described the Prime Minister as her daughter's sponsor. What kind of sponsorship does he provide? <laughs> Minister. I, I struggle to see how that question is, is directly relevant to the one that I am here to answer, but I would say, as I have said before, I'm not, I'm not here to answer for anyone's mother, I would, say here, I would say, as I have said before, that the Prime Minister had no role whatsoever in this application, uh, and we are reviewing, nonetheless, uh, the process. Maybe not in Ray. Oh, Mr. Speaker. Can I welcome my honourable friend to his place, and for the support he's providing to SMEs in this area? Can he confirm that clear criteria is applied in awarding of these grants and that grants are made on the basis of a business case and adherence to those criteria? And will he agree that members of op opposition should probably learn from the past in, in terms of suspending wild allegations until a proper review has taken place. Uh, I, I, I thank him for that question and for his uh, kind words. Uh, he is, of course, absolutely right that supporting SMEs uh, in a sector like this is particularly important. Um, it's something that we will, uh, of course, continue to do. Um, and uh, it, when it comes to the process, um, I referred to the bid earlier. Uh, this, this is the form, the uh, several dozen pages that have to be provided to access government funding. That is right and proper. Um, and he is, of course, right to say uh, that we should all uh, shy of making allegations that are unsubstantiated. Stella Creasy. Speaker, many of us will have constituents who represent companies who might bid for government funding and have constituents who have concerns about this place and the probity of anything that happens. It was a former Prime Minister who said that sunlight was the best disinfectant. If the Minister wants to defend the reputation of the Prime Minister, he's already said he's looking to publish the details of the bid, which might have the commercially sensitive information. Why doesn't he save us all the FOI and commit to publishing all of the documentation regarding this bid, including anything his officials had or received on this? I'm sure some of those trainers could show them how to do it online today, if you wanted to. <laughs> Mr. Uh, well, I think, obviously, as I said, we're doing a review into this decision. Um, I would hope that we could publish as much as we possibly can as a result of that. Uh, and she is, of course, right. Sunlight is the best uh, disinfectant in many cases. It's a policy that the government applies very widely, including in this department. We're streeting. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Probity and ethics seem to have gone out of the window with this government. So so can the Minister assure us that the Prime Minister will cooperate fully with the Department's inquiry? Will the Prime Minister cooperate fully with the Greater London Assembly's inquiry? And if, need, and if he won't, isn't it only right that the Metropolitan Police should open an inquiry as to whether there's been any misconduct in public office? Yeah. Um, I, I think, I think the uh, Honourable Gentleman is... is uh, obviously right to uh, ask the question, but uh, the reality is, of course, uh, the review will go wherever it needs to go, um, and uh, I have no indication whatsoever that anyone is not going to cooperate with that, be it the Prime Minister or anyone else. <laughs> Melanie Ong. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Minister insists on calling this a review. Why is he shying away from referring to it as an inquiry? Could he tell the House what the scope and terms of this review will be? Yeah. Uh, well, I've, 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 I've already said to the uh, chair of the select committee, who's, who's no longer in his place, that we will write to him providing more information uh, on that. Um, uh, but but all, all, all I can say is that this is a review that will, of course, leave no stone unturned. Bill Wigan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I congratulate my honourable friend on his new position, and I'm sure he will also thank Mr Speaker for choosing this UQ from the 44 that were submitted. Can you tell the House how long ago this took place and how long we've had a Labour Mayor of London who could have investigated this before? 
I am, of course, grateful, Mr. Speaker, for you, to you for providing me with my dispatch box debut, uh, as, as, the, uh, as, as the honourable member uh, alluded uh, to. He is, of course, uh, completely right to say uh, that this is a matter that uh, refers to a company that, get, that uh, was founded in 2016, refers to a process where uh, the government was not hiding any of this. We were putting out press releases uh, talking about it. Uh, perhaps the uh, Mayor of London does not check the gov.uk website as often as we might like. Vera Hobhouse. Uh, 47,000 of the 100,000 grant money has now been awarded to Hacker House. Will the remaining 53,000 be withheld until a review has been concluded? As, uh, as with all processes like this, while the review is ongoing, then uh, that process will be paused. But I would like uh, to make sure that we get on with uh, make, uh, making sure that the good work done under this fund continues as rapidly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Times today revealed that the Prime Minister previously planned to set up a £100 million fund with the owner of Hacker House. May I remind the House that as Mayor of London, the Prime Minister over oversaw the Gordon Bridge project, which had allegations of corruption and was riddled Absolutely. with conflicts of interest. Absolutely. Will the Minister reassure the House that there will be no other examples of friends with benefits funding from DCMS or any other department? Uh, of course, I speak for DCMS, but uh, as I've said, this is a process that is screwed scrupulously transparent. It is a process that is rigorous and is applied equally uh, to all. Um, she, she mentioned something about the uh, Garden Bridge. Uh, perhaps she is uh, preempting the Secretary of State for Transport, who will be here shortly. Anna Turley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Minister has said that this whole process has been rigorous, open, and transparent, and he's rightly putting the bid available, accessible to all MPs to see in the library. But surely, if he's completely confident there's been no issues with this process and he does believe in it being open and transparent, why can't he put all correspondence relating to this bid in the library so that we can see it instead of hiding behind his own governmental review? Show us the evidence. <laughs> Well, that, that, that is, of course, part of the point uh, of having the review. As I've said earlier in answer to another question, I will encourage that review to make as much of its material as is commercially possible under any circumstances as public as possible. She shakes her head. There is nothing. There, there, I, I have agreed to the premise of her question, and we will do it. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. This is not just about money, but it's also about influence, because it's been alleged that the, the Prime Minister and former Mayor of London obtained access to trade missions for Jennifer O'Curry, despite her apparently not meeting the criteria for those trips. So can you tell me on how many other occasions has the Prime Minister intervened to secure junkets for his pals? Uh, as we have said, as I have said repeatedly, there is uh, no uh, uh, input from the Prime Minister at any stage in this process. Uh, opposition members can say it as often as they like; it won't make it true. Tracy Brabin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week's open letter from the Committee on Standards in Public Life to all public office holders describes the long-established principles of selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty and leadership as a personal responsibility. Now, with the Prime Minister's disregard, seeming disregard for conflict of interest, refusal to answer questions on this issue, would he agree with me that the Prime Minister has not got the character for leading this country? Yeah. Uh, she, she, she talks about uh, the Prime Minister, he will be here later on and she can put that question to, her, uh, to him herself. Uh, but I would, I would say simply, she talks about the principles of public life. Uh, the thing that I think pu the public cannot get their heads around is how they have a parliament that is blocking the will that they expressed in a referendum. Okay. Brendan O'Hara. Thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. The Minister will realise that this isn't going to go away anytime Sorry. soon. Yeah. So doesn't he agree that, the only, that only a full independent inquiry yes. will be able to remove the stench of sleaze and scandal that is currently engulfing the Prime Minister? Mm -hmm. And that any inquiry has to investigate the circumstances of this use of public funds to check that it was legal, appropriate, there was no conflict of interest, and at no time did the now Prime Minister abuse his position or misuse public funds. If that doesn't happen, 
then the stench of sleaze and scandal which currently engulfs him will linger long. Yeah. Uh, it won't surprise him that I don't, don't accept the vast majority of uh, the premise of that question, but he says that this is not something that will go away. He's right. We are having a review. We are not seeking to make it go away. We will leave no stone unturned. Mahali. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Minister has given assurances that no member of the House of Commons was involved in lobbying for Hacker House, but can he give the same reassurances about the House of Lords? Uh, I, uh, as, as, as I've said, we are having a review. Uh, I have no uh, indication whatsoever uh, before me that uh, there is a positive answer to her question, but of course uh, we are having a review and we will make sure that that is covered. Jamie Stone. Mr Speaker, there are great numbers of people out there who are trying to get start-up businesses off the ground, and to these people a grant would be hugely welcome. Can the Secretary of State at least see that the impression, and I use my words carefully, the impression of money being doshed out to mates is corrosive to public confidence in the grant system, and that in turn is damaging to the reputation of any government? Minister. Uh, I, I, I agree that uh, the, that impression is in part why we are having the review. But I would also say, very gently to the Honourable Gentleman, one of the things uh, that is corrosive to public confidence in that process is people repeatedly making allegations when we haven't had that review and we have not yet had any proof. Dr Paul Williams. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. There have been reports that the Prime Minister, when Mayor of London, had a close relationship with Jennifer Arcuri, including receiving personal one-to-one -one technology lessons from her. <laughs> Um, can he give us assurances that even if no representations were made directly by the Prime Minister, that no representations were made on behalf of the now Prime Minister? <laughs> Minister! I, I, I have said that. Uh, I am happy to say uh, again that there was no uh, undue lobbying to the best of my knowledge. Uh, we are, of course, as I have said, having a review and we will uh, make that public. But I think, again, uh, his attempt to try and broaden the scope of this uh, will not change the fact that there is no evidence whatsoever that the Prime Minister uh, sought to do anything improper. Devin Shuka. Has this company or its directors applied for any other government funds, and if so, over what period? Successfully or unsuccessfully? Minister. Uh, the two other companies uh, that are uh, related uh, to Ms Akari have not made any applications uh, whatsoever to this department. Uh, of course, we will be double-checking that as part of uh, the review, and I'm sure the review will also look at other uh, government departments. Uh, but, uh, as, as, as I say, uh, this is uh, whatever a process that uh, is scrupulous, is transparent and is rigorous in its independence, uh, how, wh whichever company is in receipt of government money. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm sorry that the Minister is rattled, as evidenced by his dismissing questions over the Prime Minister's possible conflict of interest when he was London Mayor as, and I quote, tittle-tattle, which is contemptible and sadly shows, as did yesterday's court case, the, the staggering sense of entitlement at the heart of this government yep. with a Prime Minister who thinks he can do as he pleases. Will the Minister confirm for the House that he believes this Parliament and the public are perfectly entitled to hold the Prime Minister and his government to account, and any hints or suggestions to the contrary about tittle-tattle only show yet more disrespect for the democratic process. Oh, Mr Minister. Speaker, she tells, she tells me I'm rattled. I'm enjoying this debut rather more than I'd thought. But nonetheless, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's always a pleasure to answer pre-written questions. Uh, I would say simply uh, that, uh, that she, 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 she shows me that it's been pre-written. It's very good to see. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 she, 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 raise, she raises, to be fair, she raises an important constitutional principle, uh, and it is an important constitutional principle that this government absolutely respects and will continue to do so. Thank you. I think the honourable gentleman wants to raise a point of order appertaining to these exchanges. Very well. Point of order, Tom Watson. Mr Speaker, earlier in our exchanges, the Minister suggested that I try to register with Hacker House. I looked at social media, and there are many people online who have tried to do that, and they get an error message, 502 Bad Gateway. Could he explain why Hacker House seems to have disappeared? <laughs> Minister. No. The, the Honourable Gentleman isn't under any obligation to... 
come in on the point of order, but it's open to him to do so if he so wishes. Uh, it, it is of it, th thank, th thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it, it is of course a part of uh, this department's processes that we will make sure the services that we procure are, are properly delivered. We're very happy to have a look at that, um, and we will continue to do so. There you go. Thank you. Order. Statement. The Secretary of State for Transport, Secretary Grant Shapps. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With your Permission, I'd like to make a statement about the steps the government's been taking to support those affected by the collapse of Thomas Cook, in particular for the 150,000 passengers left abroad without a flight back, and also the 9,000 people uh, here who've lost their jobs in the UK. Mr. Speaker, this is a very sad situation with all parties uh, considered options to avoid uh, how this company could be. Uh, not put into administration. Ultimately, however, Thomas Cook and its directors took the decision themselves to place this company into insolvency proceedings, and it ceased trading at 2 a.m. on Monday, the 23rd of September. And I recognise this is a very distressing situation for all those involved. I'd like to assure members of the House that the government is committed to supporting those affected, including by providing repatriation flights free of charge for all of those people. We have been contingency planning for some time to prepare for this scenario under Operation Matterhorn. The Government and the Civil Aviation Authority have run similar operations in the past and have been working hard to minimise the disruption to passengers and to try to assist Thomas Cook's staff. Even with our preparations and previous experience with Monarch, the task before us represents the largest peacetime repatriation ever undertaken in the UK. And some disruption and delay is therefore inevitable, and we ask for understanding, particularly for Thomas Cook's staff, many of whom are still working alongside the government to try to uh, help ensure the safe return of their customers. For example, the situation reported in Cuba overnight uh, on the media. Uh, that aircraft has now left this morning and all the passengers from Cuba have been scheduled, who were scheduled to come down home today uh, on that flight. Mr Speaker, normally the CAA's responsibility for bringing back passengers uh, would extend only to customers who are covered by the Atoll scheme. However, there would have simply been insufficient capacity worldwide in the aviation market for people to be able to book tickets independently and bring themselves home for those who are non-Atoll related. Some passengers would have had to wait for perhaps a week or more, uh, and others would have suffered a personal hardship, financial hardship, as they waited for another flight. Uh, this would have created, in my view, further ec economic problems, with people unable to return to work and unable to be reunited with their families. With tens of thousands of passengers abroad and with no easy means of return to the UK, I instructed the CAA to ensure all those currently abroad were able to return atoll or non-atoll. Due to the size and complexity and geographical scope of this Thomas Cook business, it's not been possible to replicate their exact, exact airline and their schedule. In the case of Monarch Collapse back in 2017, the CAA was able to source enough aircraft of the right size and the right types uh, to closely match the airline's own aircraft. But with Thomas Cook, there's a much bigger airline, as well as providing a global network of package holidays. And as a result, the operation's been a lot more challenging. And some of the passengers will be travelling home on commercial flight, flights where others uh, have uh, available seats. And I know the whole House will want to thank all the airlines and the ground staff who've offered assistance to Thomas Cook passengers in this difficult situation. I'd like to update the House with the latest information and give honourable and right honourable members a sense of the scale of the operation that's been going on. We put arrangements in place to bring back 150,000 people across 50 different countries. Uh, this requires over 1,000 flights uh, for, by the CAA, uh, chartered aircraft, and over the next two week period. Uh, passengers will be able to complete their full holidays, so they shouldn't be leaving early 
and should instead return on the day that they were intended to. So far, in the first two days of this operation, we brought home nearly 30,000 of the 150,000 passengers uh, uh, on over 130 dedicated CAA flights. There's a further 16,500 passengers that we hope to repatriate today on something like um, 70 flights. I checked before I came into the House, and it is proceeding according to these amended schedules. So far, 95% of people have been patriated to their original point of departure. And again, we haven't been able to bring everybody back to the airport from which they left because of the difference in size and shape of those aircraft that are available. Uh, in the first two days, we've therefore provided onward travel for 2,300 passengers and have arranged an additional flight from Gatwick to Glasgow to relocate uh, passengers who have flown back to the wrong airport because of that scheduling issue. The CAA has reached out to over 3,000 hotels, issuing letters of guarantees to ensure British holidaymakers can, return, uh, can remain in the hotels in which they're booked. Uh, and that's been uh, followed up by calls and contact from FCO officials. There are over 50 overseas airports involved around the Mediterranean, North Africa, North America, and there are 11 UK airports engaged in this programme. There have been uh, over 100,000 calls to our customer service centres and over 2 million unique visitors to the CAA's dedicated <coughs> website, thomascook.caa.co.uk. That was in the first day alone, with over 7 million page views. In total, there have been 10 government departments and agencies involved, including DFT, FCO, Bayes, DWP uh, in London, and our extensive diplomatic and consular network in those countries affected. And I've been hugely impressed as this programme has been rolling out in the last couple of days. Uh, the response uh, from actually everybody involved, including Thomas Cook passengers, who've been generally positive, with many praising the CAA, local staff and government <coughs> officials, even though there's been considerable <coughs> disruption. For example, people haven't been able to advance check-in, as people are used to doing these days, instead having to queue uh, to check in at every single flight, and therefore causing some of the queues that you see on the television screens. It has, though, been generally well organised and extremely professional by all those involved. Mr Speaker, despite these robust plans and their success so far, this is an incredibly distressing situation for all concerned. One of my top priorities remains helping those passengers abroad get back to the UK and do so safely. But in addition to supporting passengers, we've also been working across government to ensure the 9,000 former Thomas Cook employees in the UK and those overseas receive the support that they need as well. The decision by Thomas Cook's group board has been deeply upsetting for employees who are losing their jobs. DWP's Job Centre Plus Rapid Response Service is in place, helping workers to get back into employment. The Job Centre Plus Rapid Response Managers across the UK are ready to engage with the liquidators uh, to start uh, that vital work. And there are special arrangements uh, in place for UK employees who are owed redundancy pay and notice pay uh, by their insolvent employer. That's through the redundancy payment service and the insolvency service, so that statutory pay amounts owed to former employees uh, can be made through the National Insurance Fund. I want to say more about this later, but I'll do so through questions. My colleague, uh, the, my right on friend, the Secretary of State, Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, is establishing a cross-government task force to address the impact on employees and local communities. This will help to overcome barriers to attending training, securing a job, self-employment, such as providing childcare costs, uh, tools, work clothes, travel costs. My colleagues and I have been in contact with those members whose constituencies have been hardest hit by these job losses and given assurances that we will work with the industry to offer what support we can. And in fact, pretty much every honourable member's constituency is affected in some way, uh, even if only through a number of people working in a single uh, shop location. My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, has also written to the Financial Reporting Council to ensure they prioritise, as a matter of urgency, an investigation into both the causes of the company's failure and the conduct of its directors and of its auditors. And Mr Speaker, I'm also aware of the duty this government has to the taxpayer 
And while affected passengers have been told they will not have to pay to be flown back to the UK, we have entered into discussions with third parties uh, with a view to recovering some of the costs of this large operation. Around 60% of passengers have atoll protection, and the CAA's Air Travel Trust Fund will contribute proportionately to the costs of repatriation, as well as refunding atoll future bookings. We'll also look to recoup some of the costs uh, from the relevant credit and debit card providers and travel insurers, and we'll look to recover costs from other travel providers uh, through which passengers may have booked as uh, their Thomas Cook holiday. Uh, we're also, I should say, in discussion with the official receiver to understand what costs can be recouped through the company's assets as well. The final cost of repatriation for um, the Monarch situation back in 2017 was about £50 million, including atoll contributions. The repatriation efforts for Thomas Cook is now known to be about twice the size uh, and is more complicated for the reasons I've explained. Uh, I've also seen it suggested in the press that the government should have avoided the collapse with a bailout of up to £250 million uh, for the company and its shareholders. Given the perilous state of the business, including the company's own reported £1.5 billion half-year loss reported in May, followed by a further profit warning in November, this simply was not the case, with no guarantee that an injection would have secured the future of the company. In effect, Mr Speaker, our concern is we would put £250 million uh, risk being thrown away, good money after bad, and then still had to pay for the cost of this repatriation. It is quite clear that in the last several years, the company ran into a number of different problems trying to expand itself out through investing more in the high street rather than less, uh, whilst the entire market was moving in the opposite direction. The loss, nonetheless, of an iconic uh, British brand with 178-year history, one of the oldest travel companies in the world, is an extremely sad moment. However, this should not be seen uh, as a reflection on the general health of the UK aviation industry, which continues to thrive. Passenger numbers are actually up. People are travelling more. The truth is uh, that the way people have booked their holidays has changed an enormous amount over the years, but it didn't change as much with the company. None of this should distract from the distress experienced by those business, uh, businesses reliant on Thomas Cook passengers and Thomas Cook employees, who, as I've said, have worked above and beyond, particularly in recent days during this distressing situation. We've never had the collapse of an airline or a holiday company on this scale before. We've responded swiftly and decisively. Right now, our efforts are rightly focused on getting those passengers home and looking after those employees who have lost their jobs. But we also need to understand whether any individuals have failed in their duties of stewardship within the company. Uh, then our efforts will turn to working through the reforms necessary to ensure that passengers do not find themselves in this ridiculous situation again. We need to look at the options, not just in atoll, but also, also whether it's possible for airlines to be wound down in a more ordinary manner. I, I look, uh, uh, they need to be able to look after their customers, and we need to be able to ensure that their planes can keep flying in order that we don't end up having to set up a shadow airline uh, for no matter what period of time. And this is where we'll focus our efforts in the next couple of weeks, Mr Speaker. But in order to do this, we will require primary legislation and, dare I say it, a new session of this Parliament. <laughs> Mr Speaker, in what's been a challenging time, might I put on record my appreciation for the work of all those involved in this effort, and in particular, Richard Mariotti, the CEO of the CAA, who, along with his team and uh, my officials in the DFT, have done an extraordinary job so far. I'm also grateful for the support of others, including the Mayor of Manchester, who's acknowledged the government's repatriation effort and its work uh, with all of the agencies involved in helping to get people home. This has been an unprecedented response to an unprecedented situation. I'm grateful to all parties who stepped in to support these efforts, and I commend this statement to the House. Annie McDonald. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I'd like to thank the Secretary of State for his timely advance sight of his statement. It's a welcome change. Uh, but what, I what I don't welcome 
is the collapse of Thomas Cook, which is a tragedy for the 178-year-old business, its customers and, and its staff. The travel company went under because successive chief executives failed to steer the group effectively or evolve the business. Thomas Cook had five offers for its airline business, yet these were rejected by the board. And I too would like to pay tribute to Richard Moriarty and his team at the Civil Aviation Authority for the work done to yet again repatriate holidaymakers. I applaud their sense of public service and duty. Aviation is a fiercely competitive industry which has lost services because of terrorism and Brexit uncertainty. Government dithering on its aviation strategy has only added to these difficulties. In May, the Secretary of State's predecessor said the government will work swiftly to introduce the reforms to airline insolvencies that are needed to ensure a strong level of consumer protection and value for money for the taxpayer. This was misleading. The government has done nothing to protect consumer or taxpayer interests. The government has sat back and let the company fold. Yesterday, governments in Scandinavia stepped in to back Thomas Cook's subsidiaries in that region. The German government also stepped in with a loan of 380 million euros for Thomas Cook's subsidiary Condor to help that company survive. Chief Executive of Thomas Cook Airlines, Christoph de Bus, has seamlessly just gone to work for Condor, and jubilant scenes of the survival of the subsidiary are doing the rounds on social media. Can the Secretary of State tell the House what steps his government took to enter into a joint investment with other interested nation states, as it is reported that the governments of Spain and Turkey, quite understandably, were willing, but seemingly the UK government was not. We are somewhat assured that there is provision to return holidaymakers to the UK, but sadly, there is no provision for the return of Thomas Cook's staff. The unions unite and the TSSA have valiantly fought for their members while this government has done nothing. Can he guarantee that all staff will be repatriated? Can he say what provisions he's putting in place to ensure that customers who have lost their planned holidays are fully compensated and are able to make alternative arrangements at no expense to themselves? Mr Speaker, the government's learned nothing from the monarch collapse two years ago. Monarch cost taxpayers £40 million in repatriation costs, and Thomas Cook looks set to cost a similar amount or more, not to mention redundancy in future welfare payments. Can he give an estimate of, the, of the, what those total costs are likely to be? Monarch, of course, was a victim of financial engineering by Grable Capital two years ago and conflicts of interest with the company's administrator. Similarly, the collapse of Thomas Cook raises major questions about the accounting of the firm PwC and EY, never mind the bonuses paid to senior executives. And on that point, will the Secretary of State make clear to those executives that they should return their multi-million pound undeserved and unwarranted bonuses, including that of Peter Funkhausen, who's had £4.6 million in bonuses since 2014? I say again, the government has not acted to protect the public interest. Nothing has been learned or done in terms of improving how our insolvency arrangements deal with such exceptional and complex circumstances. What's more, the Atoll Fund has been much reduced by the monarch fiasco and has had to rely on insurance to make up the shortfall. Does he believe the reforms to Atoll enacted by his government have been effective? The government must confirm it will immediately guarantee the worker full compensation for unfair dismissal, given the lack of proper consultation, and that those workers will not have to pursue the matter through the courts. Can he confirm that they will be relieved of that burden and stress? Mr Speaker, in a further sad development, we also learned today that Northern Ireland's last manuf manufacturer, Wright Bus, has gone into administration with the loss of 1,400 jobs. In July, the Prime Minister said, we will do everything we can
to ensure the future of that great UK company. <laughs> Isn't it the case that this government is guilty of the industrial neglect of this country? In contrast to other countries, UK ministers have stood by and let some of our great companies wither and die. This government is engulfed with inertia and incompetence. It's not a functioning government because of a Brexit chaos and prorogation paralysis it has brought upon itself. The people of Britain are paying a high price for their inadequacy. Yep. They've failed to reform insolvency rules yep. and failed to improve financial That's reporting. Right, it's a colossal failure yep. of political leadership from this government. They were warned, but they did yep. nothing. It's a shameful failure to yep. fulfil their duties and yep. their responsibilities. Well, Mr Speaker, um, let me see what we can deal with here. I mean, first of all, uh, it, it is true to say, as the Honourable Gentleman uh, outlines, that the world had changed. In 2007, uh, Thomas Cook bought my travel, uh, just as the internet was starting to take off. In 2016, as the high street was clearly struggling as the internet had taken off, they bought the high street shops of co-op travel. Uh, further expanding their problems and their massive debt to, I think, £1.7 billion. I do agree with him. I do agree with him that this was, in the end, a very poorly run business going in the wrong direction uh, at the wrong time. And he makes the very sensible point, uh, querying, in fact, about uh, the return of bonuses that we've all been uh, reading about. I already, already described how my right honourable friend has written to the uh, insolvency service, and they do, do have powers under the 1986. The official receiver uh, does have powers to uh, require, in certain circumstances, the return of bonuses. And I uh, absolutely agree with him that this needs to be fully looked into, including uh, the role of the auditors as well. So that is where we agree. Where we disagree is this is not, it is not the case um, that uh, this is somehow unique to Thomas Cook. Uh, in fact, airlines uh, are in good health, as I mentioned before, uh, elsewhere across our um, sector, many of whom have actually been very helpful bringing Thomas Cook passengers home this last couple of days and have offered extraordinary uh, help uh, even lending uh, aircraft in the case of one of the uh, well-known airlines, cutting their prices rather than charging more to Thomas Cook uh, customers. But actually, he mentions about this insolvency, and it's only right to point out that Air Germania, a German uh, airline, went bust. Primera Air, a Danish airline, went bust. Air Berlin, a German airline, went bust. Colbo Air, Cyprus, uh, Fly VLM, Belgium. This is not a UK issue. This is an issue where some airlines manage to do the right things and succeed, and others don't. Now, he mentions about, quite rightly, about what's happened with Condor. And here uh, we will find some partial agreement and partial disagreement. Condor was operating under a somewhat different business model. In Germany, people are not booking holidays in quite the same way as they have been in the UK, partly because UK citizens tend to be using the internet in different ways, much more becoming their own travel agents, where uh, with Condor, uh, that business remained profitable. Uh, the Honourable Lady asked what difference this makes. The difference it makes is it was a profitable business, unlike here. And it is also the case, and this is where I think there'll be a degree of uh, uh, agreement, it is also the case that the German insolvency rules allow for administrations to take place, allow for those aircraft to carry on being used, and allow for other buyers to come in during that administration process, which is not something that our current airline liquidation insolvency rules allow for. He rightly points out that the previous Secretary of State said he wanted to do something about this and he commissioned a review. Just so we're all clear on the timeline here, that review reported on the 9th of May 2019 uh, and suggested that what we should do is have rules which are not dissimilar to the German rules to allow our airlines to trade in administration, which would make a repatriation massively easier because we could use those airlines. I entirely agree with the honourable gentleman, and perhaps he didn't hear me mention it uh, during my statement. We need a new session of Parliament to introduce that primary legislation in order to bring that in. I, I do also want to, we're very happy to have a new 
we are very happy to have that new session of Parliament. Uh, if we can get agreement, maybe that is something we can um, progress. Um, I believe that given the number of people and the number of lives that are being affected by this, we should be working together cross-party to get this job done. And I welcome uh, the Honourable uh, Member gesturing that he would give support to sort this problem out because it would clearly be in everybody's interest. Now, the Honourable Gentleman also makes reference to whether foreign governments were prepared to sort of ride to the rescue. I can confirm that I received no approach from the Turkish government, and the only contact via the uh, Spanish uh, government was not a viable uh, plan. Indeed, it came so late in the day that the company was already starting its proceedings on uh, administration. Uh, so there was no viable uh, plan uh, out there at the time. Uh, I also agree with him that the Atoll system uh, should be uh, reformed as well, although, as he rightly points out, uh, although the funds are limited because of Monarch, the Atoll themselves are reinsured to cover uh, most of that cost. Uh, and finally, just on a point of accuracy, uh, the Honourable Gentleman mentioned £40 million on Monarch. In fact, we think the final cost was £50 million for Monarch. No, no, we can't take points of order during a statement. Points of order would flow after either this statement or other statements at the discretion of the Chair. Shadish Vara. Mr Speaker, the UK headquarters for Thomas Cook is based in my constituency, and the collapse of the company has meant the loss of 1,200 local jobs. Clearly, our thoughts go out to all of those people, and indeed the thousands more across the UK who have also been affected. Would my right honourable friend join me in paying tribute, however, to the many local organisations and companies that have come forward offering jobs to those who have been affected. We have the local newspaper, Peterborough Telegraph, coordinating the activities, and we've also seen acts of kindness. Peterborough United and Peterborough Phantoms, a local ice hockey team, are offering free tickets for those affected. Would my right honourable friend recognise that at this difficult time, we need to also appreciate and applaud the generosity that is coming through. Well, Mr Speaker, can I start by paying tribute to my um, honourable friend, who has been uh, working very hard, I know, uh, through the last uh, few difficult days with people who have found themselves without uh, work from uh, Peaceborough uh, and the tremendous work he's done with his community in supporting all those who have lost their job. There are actually 630 job centres running the rapid response service mobilised uh, to pick up uh, this issue for every single uh, former Thomas Cook employee who has lost their job as a result of this appalling news. Of course, I should say that the best thing we can do of all is make sure we operate in an economy where there is record high employment and record low unemployment, because that will give people the best opportunity to get back into a good job. Alan Brown. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank the Secretary for an advanced sight of the statement and also pay tribute to the work of the CAA and the Thomas Cook employees who have went above and beyond to help the stranded yeah. holdmakers. Yeah. And obviously I'd like to express sympathies for all those that have lost their jobs. <laughs> But, Mr Speaker, instead of the government using the mantra that this is the biggest peacetime re repatriation, the UK government should actually be apologising for this collapse happening in their watch. Yeah, yeah. Now, the Secretary does speak of reforms that require new legislation to stop this happening again with another, con uh, with another company. But why were lessons not learned from the collapse yeah. of Monarch just two years ago? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What are the timescales for this new legislation? I'd point out procedurally a new session is not required for legislation. Yeah, the government yeah, could bring it yeah, forward yeah, if they absolutely. wanted. Yeah. Now, could you re-explain what the position is with Spain and Turkey and the fact that they were looking at ways to keep Thomas Cook trading while the UK government was not willing to? And again, what the German government did lead the way in how they kept Condor going. Now, he says £250 million would be good money after bad, but what discussions did the government actually have with Thomas Cook and what financial appraisal did the government uh, do to actually arrive at the, the position they say they couldn't fund that money? I would point out that this is a government that can find £100 million to advertise that Brexit is good for us, yeah, so I, I think they should spend that money supporting jobs instead. Yeah, so can you explain what impact did Brexit actually have on the collapse of Thomas Cook? Because ah. they warned about the impact of Brexit. Yeah. And what, what impact has the collapse of Sterling had in the company's trading position as well? Ah. 
What, what assessment has the government made of the pension liabilities for Tom, uh, Thomas Cook? And what plans does the government have going forward to curb outrageous executive pay, given that close to £50 million pounds has been taken out of Thomas Cook in yeah, recent yeah. years? Yeah, yeah. Now, I welcome the update on the holidaymakers from Cuba, but are there any further holidaymakers who are effectively being held ransom or captive? And what discussions is the UK government having with other foreign governments when such ruthless actions have been taken? Yeah. Mr Speaker, Thomas Cook vouchers are now worthless. So when will the government finally implement a scheme for protection of vouchers and gift cards when companies become insolvent? Yeah, yeah. What actions is the government taking to support the 13,000 employees that are still abroad? And finally, Mr Speaker, I've got constituents who have lost their jobs. Can the Secretary look my constituents at eye and honestly say there's nothing more this government could have done to save their jobs? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, just on the point about uh, Thomas Cook employees uh, abroad, I should have picked it up from a previous comment. Um, actually, we are uh, bringing some of those people back, so starting with the the crews uh, uh, and the, uh, the operational people. I think I'm right in saying that yesterday we had brought about 150 back so far. It's not the case that we're ignoring them uh, at all. We need to bring passengers back first. I've asked the CEA to be as flexible as possible uh, in bringing those people back, and he's quite right to remind me that I hadn't mentioned that before. There were a number of the other questions that I had previously uh, answered, so I don't want to go round uh, in circles. But look, uh, the House um, must know that no government would want to lose a 178 uh, year old, a uh, famous British iconic name. And uh, whilst I hear people say, why didn't you just put the money in? The answer is because it, you, all you'd have to do is open their books and realise that if you've got a 1.7 billion debt, if you lost 1.5 billion in six months alone, if you've then issued another profit warning, this is entirely different, I'm afraid, from the Condor situation, which was a fundamentally profitable uh, airline. And it just would not be responsible to throw good money after bad and still be back here in probably a very short period of time offering this bailout in order to get people home, not to bail out the company. Um, so it just was not uh, a going uh, concern with which we could um, do that. The Honourable Gentleman asked very sensible questions about whether there are other uh, holidaymakers being held ransom uh, or captive elsewhere in the world. I am not aware of any other location in which that's the case at the moment, to answer him. However, it is a live and moving situation. Uh, the CAA have, under uh, our direction, uh, been issuing uh, proactive letters to explain that their bills will be settled in places where some of these hotels will not have had the bill settled for the last three months, again going to the bankrupt nature of the uh, company concerned. Um, and uh, last night in Cuba, yesterday in Cuba, our foreign missions were very, very helpful, and I pay tribute and thank them uh, for uh, actively, proactively getting in touch with ministers and resolving that appalling uh, situation uh, there. Um, so I think that covers the majority of the questions that I had not already previously answered. Andrew Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, as somebody who worked in the travel industry for many years, I was saddened to see the demise of Cook's. But it is also worth noting that this sector has seen some notable collapses over the years. The scale and complexity of this repatriation operation is significant, and thank him for his update. But because this is a sector which is prone to significant collapses, can I ask him to maintain, after this, this urgent work on repatriation has been completed, to focus upon the industry structure and the sector insurance schemes that will protect both passengers and taxpayers in the future? Well, my my honourable friend is absolutely right. The, the airline insolvency review, uh, which reported in May, uh, provides quite a, a few useful uh, ideas about things that could be done, including some things which require pri primary legislation and other things that don't, and we've already started to um, act upon. Uh, but uh, he's absolutely right. We can't have this situation keep returning time and time again. It's terrible for passengers, it's terrible for all those involved, and it provides uh, a problem in actually finding sufficient aircraft uh, to solve the problem when it happens. The Secretary of State will be aware that the Honourable Gentleman the Member for Harrogate and Knaresborough is himself a distinguished former Transport Minister. Indeed, I well recall that when the Honourable Gentleman served at one stage as Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Buses, being a man of the people as he is, he was wont to come to work on the bus, no doubt to the very considerable delight 
of his fellow passengers. <laughs> Lisa Forbes. Following the sudden collapse of Thomas Cook, which was headquartered in Peterborough, and the loss of 1,200 jobs there, many of my constituents turned up for work only to find that their jobs were lost, with Christmas fast approaching. And my honourable friend uh, for North West Cambridgeshire is absolutely correct. Um, there has been an incredible outpouring of unity by individuals and businesses in Peterborough who have stepped up to show their support and solidarity at what is an extremely difficult and distressing time for so many in Peterborough. But can the Secretary of State tell me what specific support the government is giving to my constituents who have mortgages and bills to pay yeah. and families to support yeah. in terms of finding alternative employment? And what measures have they put in place to support the city's economy as a whole, given the loss of so many good jobs? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the Honourable Lady is absolutely right, including about the response in Peterborough, which I've been tracking uh, closely through uh, Honourable Members, including my Honourable Friend and others. Uh, there is a bespoke service which will be available through the Job Centre Plus. I've spoken at length to uh, my uh, right Honourable Friend, the Business Secretary, who is uh, herself leading a cross-government task force, which is meeting, I think, again tomorrow afternoon, uh, in order to uh, continue to work on the issues of helping people out uh, uh, to find new jobs. I mentioned in my statement about additional assistance that's uh, available through things like uh, retraining, but even simple things like childcare whilst people go for interview uh, and the like. Uh, it is heartening to know that there are jobs available regionally, uh, but it will be a shock. It is an economic shock to any region to lose a thousand plus um, jobs, and uh, we absolutely determined to support uh, through the various mechanisms, in particular the Rapid Response Service, uh, all of her and my honourable friend's constituents. I was going to go to Mr. Robert Halfon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I thank my honourable friend for what, right on what he's doing, but my constituents have lost their jobs. The directors go back to their million pound plus houses. They've taken £47 million in bonuses and wages over the past few, few years. My constituents have worries about their job and worry about their pensions. Should we not be seizing the assets of the directors who plundered this company and yeah, yeah. took it to ruin? And will he guarantee that my constituents' pre uh, pensions will be protected? Yeah. Well, I, I understand the uh, concern uh, of my honourable friend and also I uh, congratulate him for the work that I know he's been doing these last few days with uh, his constituents who have lost their jobs. We've touched on it before and there have been a lot of reports in the newspapers. I think it's very important to allow uh, the correct channels, the official receiver, uh, to do their uh, job in this regard. But to stress to the House, under the 1986 Insolvency Act, the official receiver's liquidator may indeed seek to overturn uh, a range of transactions made prior to the liquidation. And I, to be clear, that includes things like these bonuses which are being, uh, which have been mentioned, though I do think we need to leave it to due pro process to see uh, whether that would be uh, appropriate. There's also the Company Directors Disqualif Disqualification Act 1986. And, uh, you know, I, for one, fully support the idea, and one of the reasons why, in answer to former questions, uh, that the government was so concerned uh, about uh, what was going on is to ensure that we're not propping up an organisation which was already doing things wrong. Lillian Greenwood. Speaker, can I begin by welcoming the tremendous efforts uh, by the Civil Aviation Authority, staff across government and others to repatriate and support the many thousands of stranded holidaymakers. But if I can just ask the Secretary of State to provide clarity on two points in relation to answers he's given to other members. Can he confirm that all Thomas Cook staff will be helped to return home? He referred to some of them, and I don't understand. If not all, why not? And can he also uh, set out why, what in the last four and a half months since the airline insolvency review reported, what action the government have taken to implement those recommendations? Yes, I thank the, the Honourable Lady. Um, so, first of all, with regard to um, the repatriation of, of staff, it's not the case that all the staff want to return. Some uh, don't necessarily want to come straight back. Those who are, uh, for example, air crew uh, have been being 
been being uh, repatriated. Many others are actually still assisting with the operation on the ground uh, in many, many different locations, and we're hugely grateful um, to them. The reason that this next two weeks is critical is uh, with the large sort of proportion of people, the holiday makers, the 150,000, that's the group of people that constitutes a grouping so large that there is no other way to get them back other than chartering our own aircraft and flying them back. Whereas the numbers of people then involved uh, are of the size where commercial flights can be used um, to return people. So we are urgently addressing not just the cabin crew and that side of things, but also other employees and scheduling them when they'll need to get back. And we will, I have been very clear with the CAA, offer them every uh, possible uh, assistance uh, along the way. I'm sorry, I forgot her second question. What have you been doing in the last... <laughs> Since May. What have I been doing? Well, personally, I didn't come into the job till the 23rd of um, uh, July. Uh, but um, with, regard to, with regard to some of those measures, there are indeed things that have already happened from the airline insolvency review um, that have already been taken into account and indeed used in this particular uh, case. Um, but it is also the case uh, that we do require that primary legislation. I'm very happy to have those cross-party discussions about um, using those. It's not, as you might imagine, quite as simple as it seems, because there are uh, ideas around, for example, allowing what happens in Germany, where you run the airline in administration. That's one idea. But a separate thing is the interaction between atoll and a proposed additional charge per flight uh, of perhaps 50p or so uh, for every flight that's taken, regardless of whether somebody's on a holiday uh, destination. So there are a number of different things to be uh, worked through, and discussions have been on ongoing on those, and I'm very keen to accelerate them. Merriman. Speaker, I find this situation maddening in, in as much as two years ago, in the same statement that was being given on Monarch, I welcome the largest peacetime repatriation effort, and I welcome the current largest peacetime repatriation effort. But I called for reform so that we had a similar type of insolvency regime for airlines as they have in the States, Chapter 11, and they also have in Germany and Italy. And I was told by the then Secretary of State that we would indeed look at that. Two years on, we've had a review, but we haven't delivered anything. And I say this to the Secretary of State. Rather than repeating what happened before, can we please make sure that we absolutely reform this sector so that we do not put jobs at risk, we do not ruin holiday experiences, and we do not lose taxpayers' money? It's all about actions, not words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in simple terms, yes. As I, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the review reported on the 9th of May. I've been in this role since the 23rd of July. But the answer is quite simply, yes, we'll get on with it. Luciana Berger. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, in further to that very important question from the Honourable Member opposite, if you would indulge me, Mr Speaker, it's, uh, there was three very important sentences that the Secretary of State shared with this House. He said, our efforts will turn to working through the reforms necessary to ensure passengers do not find themselves in this position again. We need to look at all the options, not just at all, but also whether it is possible for airlines to be able to wind down in an orderly manner and look after their customers themselves without the need for government to step in. This is where we will focus our efforts in the weeks and months ahead. Mr Speaker, these are the exact same words given in response to the collapse of Monarch in October 2017 by his mm -hmm. predecessor, the Right Honourable Member for Epsom and Ewell. Ah, He's not here. But, frankly, the House will have heard everything that the Secretary of State just said. It's frankly appalling that two years on we find ourselves in exactly the same position. What has happened to the Government's plan and what could have been avoided to ensure that this devastating impact on staff and on holidaymakers and the cost of this country doesn't happen again? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well, look, I, I, just, I reject the characterisation that nothing has happened because, in fact, the Airline Insolvency Review... Well, hold on a second. The online ins Airline Insolvency Review was a piece of work which required time. In fact, it was only published, the final version was only published on the 9th of May. And we're now, as somebody's pointed out, a few months later, and we're getting on with it. So, you know, uh, I will absolutely ensure uh, that we work, and I hope cross-party on this, to get on with it. This is not as quite as simple as everyone uh, might imagine, because it is a multifaceted thing rather than one single Thing that requires um, doing. Uh, but she absolutely has my undertaking, and I will get on with this. Ben Patterson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can I thank my right honourable friend for his statement? And I particularly <coughs> like the passage on employees following a call I had from a constituent today who is a senior 
or was a senior employee of Thomas Cook Airlines and has been made redundant. And he's quite rightly seriously aggrieved that directors of Thomas Cook Airlines are continuing to function as directors of Thomas Cook Condor and are continuing to be remunerated. Uh, he mentions in the statement that the Secretary of State for Bayes uh, report, asking a report from the Financial Reporting Council. Could the Secretary of State please commit to looking at the relations between Thomas Cook Airlines and Thomas Cook Condor and the propriety of directors continuing to receive compensation while other employees have all been made redundant? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I can say to my right honourable friend, it is for the official receiver to do that work, and I know the re official receiver has the powers of the company directors' disqualification act, and will doubtless do that. I should also say the reason we know about um, all of these uh, payments to um, executives, and it's quite right we do, is because of the transparency that's been put in place over the last few years, quite rightly, uh, to ensure that, amongst other things, shareholders can uh, uh, see and hold their. Uh, CEOs to account. To date, the erudition of questions has been equalled only by their length. But unfortunately, there is a premium upon time as we have other matters with which we have to deal. So I'm appealing now to colleagues to cast aside pre written scripts and to confine themselves to single sentence, preferably short sentence, questions without preamble so that we can progress. Rachel Reeves. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Bay Select Committee believe that Thomas Cook's directors and their auditors have serious questions to answer. In the last five years, £20 million of bonuses have been paid to those directors, and the company has now gone under with more than £3 billion worth of debt. So can the Secretary of State confirm that the directors of Thomas Cook will not be able to remain, continue as directors at any other firm until the insolvency service has completed their investigation. Yeah. And will the government now also commit that the Financial Reporting Council will be replaced, as our select committee has called for, with a regulatory framework that holds the directors to account? I think I'd answered the first point about the uh, Insolvency Act and the Company Director Disqualification Act, and it is for, as she will know, the official receiver to do that part of the work. I can't pre-empt it. Uh, she tempts me into other areas which are a long way from the transport brief, so I think I'd better uh, not provide a, an answer there. Ah, now, in my experience, the Honourable Member for Stafford is a notably well-behaved fellow, and so I'm sure he'll confine himself to a single sentence. Jeremy Lefroy. Is uh, there any way that the... Uh, disgraceful hiking, often two or three times, of prices by other providers can be looked at under competition regulation. Here, here. My honourable friend would be interested here. I actually asked these questions just yesterday of the um, CAA and asked them to uh, investigate for me. It, they believe that probably automatic pricing had kicked in and was then overridden uh, quickly afterwards. Um, I mentioned in my uh, statement that there were some uh, airlines who've done the opposite, for whom I'm grateful, and it seems right that I should mention them. EasyJet actually cut their prices by 15% for Thomas Cook uh, uh, pa passengers, and I'm grateful for airlines who have done that and have lent their aircraft as well. Lucy Powell. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. With over 3,000 employees in Greater Manchester, our economy is obviously being hit particularly hard. But can I press the Secretary of State further? on what has been done over the last four to five months when the warning signs were all there and people could still buy package holidays just 24, 36 hours yeah. before the collapse. Shouldn't we be doing more when the warning signs are so clear? Yeah. Yeah. To say, I, I do have a lot of sympathy with the, the Honourable Lady's uh, comments. I, I've found the process of knowing that there's a struggling airline and having uh, Operation Matterhorn underway and yet not being able to say anything, obviously, because you then precipitate the danger of collapse uh, is very, very unsatisfactory. And it comes back to, so many members have now mentioned it, this idea we have to have a route out of this which includes administration so that there isn't an instant collapse and then there could be a much better and controlled path here for everyone, including uh, employees. I, I absolutely agree with her and we will get something done about this. Antoinette Sandbach. Mr Speaker, 
Will the Secretary of State um, join me in praising Thomas Cook employees who turned up for work on Monday to help yeah. repatriate passengers? Yeah. And will he make sure that the inquiries of the Insolvency Service also look at the impact of the 20% depreciation in the pound against the euro on Thomas Cook to assess whether or not the other travel industries based in the UK are vulnerable to the same currency movements? My honourable friend is absolutely right about the extraordinary work um, of employees who knew that they'd lost their job, still today working, uncertain uh, about their future in many of those foreign and some uh, British locations. He's absolutely right about that, and I pay complete tribute, I'm, I'm sure, on behalf of the whole uh, House. There are many, many factors that led to uh, the collapse. Uh, of this company. Uh, I think management, which has been mentioned many times, uh, pays a very large contributory part. But so do all sorts of other issues, including a very hot summer last year that stopped people from going away following the wrong uh, business model, the growth of the uh, internet, and problems which stretch back way past any of us in this House ever uh, voted to have a referendum about Brexit. Clive Betts. The Secretary of State said that we need to legislate to reform the travel industry and that we need a new sessions of Parliament to do it. Will he therefore give a guarantee that there will be a bill to this effect in the Queen's speech? Without wanting to reveal the contents of the Queen's speech, I hope he'll appreciate that I have hinted uh, very broadly at where we want to go. And with the reassurance of the uh, opposition front bench, I think he will have his uh, asks answered. Henry Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the uh, Transport Secretary join me in paying tribute to airlines like Virgin Atlantic, EasyJet and travel operators like TUI, who have reached out to former Thomas Cook employees offering employment? And can I encourage the government to get on with changing that insolvency law uh, and adopt a system similar to Chapter 11 protection, which yeah. has saved so many US airlines? Absolutely. My, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and he mentions some airlines. I should add in BA, TUI, Virgin, EasyJet, Ryanair, uh, all of whom and others have been incredibly helpful. Uh, and actually also uh, worth mentioning that many of these are very profitable uh, airlines. There isn't something systemic in the British uh, business which is causing uh, a problem. Most of these British airlines uh, are doing uh, very well. And I've already answered the point about Chapter 11 or, or equivalent. Cowan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have two constituents who are stuck in Mexico. They were told they were on a flight. When they turned up for it, they were told they weren't. They face the real possibility of no accommodation, no flights. They are tired, they are anxious, they are running out of money. What has the government laid aside under Operation Matterhorn to help people st stuck in such tra in transit while trying to get home? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's hugely, it's hugely yeah. distressing to hear about people who are uh, stuck. Uh, what I will say to him uh, is the CAA are actively, actively uh, monitoring anyone who calls in and the, the lines there, the websites there, and even people who post on social media. And if he himself uh, would like to try to get them uh, assistance, I will make sure that he's able to hook up with the CAA to get uh, the message through. It should be said, I don't know their particular circumstances, whether they're at all or not. In other words, whether their hotel is automatically being paid, it looks like uh, not. Um, but every effort is being made to bring them home. And I hope he will understand that hiring 45 aircraft when the max uh, uh, 737 is uh, out of commission and therefore the market is restricted has meant that this is an enormous project which has meant that sometimes we've had the wrong size aircraft for the number of passengers there but his constituents if they're stuck uh, will be given every assistance and I think that uh, he and I can help get that uh, get them the, the assistance Government. Nigel Mills distinguish between passengers on a package holiday booking and on a flight-only booking in this situation. Would the Secretary of State agree we should now bring flight-only bookings into the atoll regime so we can actually have a fair contribution from those passengers and the airlines? Yeah, it's not quite the case that we can't uh, distinguish, though I take his point. We can distinguish between the two, but I do think there's a very strong argument for making sure that when you book a flight one way or the other, that is uh, insured and the cost doesn't then ultimately fall on the taxpayer. Kevin Jones. The directors have worked, walked away with millions while hard working uh, <coughs> employees of Thomas Cook, such as uh, Gemma Lynch in my constituent economy at the weekend, has lost her job. Could the Secretary of State outline how she and others can contact uh, the DWP for the help that's been outlined? And separately, would he make uh, any comment about the pensioners 
that they're in receipt of pension or future pension arrangements for those who are already paid into the pension? So on, on, the pen, on the pensions um, front, I should say, I think there are four different uh, Thomas Cook pensions, uh, the largest of which is a billion pound uh, uh, fund, and that will now be held through the, uh, handled through the usual uh, insolvency uh, pension fund process. Um, it is, of course, a worrying time for everyone uh, involved, and with regard to uh, her constitu his constituent that he uh, mentions, DWP are ready for her to make uh, contact through the Rapid Response Unit. Uh, and if I could ask him if there are any difficulties, to please alert me and I will make sure that the uh, business secretary and that uh, task force is immediately switched on to any problem that occurs. Very keen to get real-time feedback on this. James Cartledge. Mr Speaker, um, like many uh, colleagues, I have a Thomas Cook branch in Sudbury in my constituency, which is closed, and I'm grateful to him for the work he will be putting in place to support um, redundant staff. But does he agree with me that the biggest cause of that collapse was the unsustainable debt that this yeah. company had, which came from uh, a merger strategy that was completely <coughs> flawed, and that those who oversaw those mergers and would have earned handsomely from it, and those who have run this company uh, into the ground, must be held to account? Yeah. Well, I entirely agree with my honourable friend. Look, companies do sometimes go bust. The problem with this is they're going bust, leaving a lot of people, a lot of people at a massive scale and this country uh, with an enormous problem to resolve. Uh, and that is why I think he's right about everything he's just said. Daniel Zeichner. Airports like Stansted, Mr Speaker, have really stepped up helping people come home, but also um, have job opportunities. And can I have an assurance from the Secretary of State that every Thomas Cook employee will be made aware of the opportunities that are available at the airports like Stansted? Hey, hey. But the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right. Stansted, in fact, all the other airports I've been in touch with, uh, with, with many of them, uh, have been very forthcoming with their assistance. Stansted are, are building a, a STEM college there at the moment with lots of job uh, opportunities. Uh, and I think it's, he's made the point, it's on record, uh, that uh, Thomas Cook uh, employees who are losing their jobs will no doubt find some of those travel-related jobs very interesting indeed. Thank you very much. Douglas Ross. Mr Speaker, Murray had two branches of Thomas Cook prior to the collapse, one in Bucky and one in Elgin. I've been in discussions with the Business Secretary over the last few days, but can the Secretary of State reiterate what the Government is doing to support, advise and help former employees of this company, both in high streets across Murray in the United Kingdom, but also those still abroad? We, yes, absolutely. I mean, this rapid, uh, Job Centre Plus rapid response um, service is absolutely set up, ready and mobilised um, to assist. As I said in a previous response, if uh, any of my, right on, my honourable friend's uh, constituents walk in and find that's not the case, then I will certainly want to know about it so that we can work on this cross-government uh, cross task force to ensure they're getting the help that they need. Rob House. Following the closure of 588 Thomas Cook outlets, including the one in Abbeygate Street in Bath, what is he and his government doing about the halting the further decline of the high street? My, uh, my, honourable, my right honourable friend, the, the high streets minister, has already been in contact with me uh, about the hole that this leaves, the further hole that this leaves in our uh, high street, uh, and he has a number of um, fantastic programmes that many of us in this House will have our own local authorities bidding for uh, in order to enhance uh, and improve uh, high streets, which are, as this latest collapse has shown, dramatically changing as people need to come to the high street for an experience uh, or for a service that they can't get elsewhere, perhaps online. Uh, and my um, right honourable friend, we're very happy to speak to the honourable lady about it. Richard Graham. Well, action taken on the priorities, which are to repatriate customers as soon as possible and to help innocent staff like those at Thomas Cook Gloucester get new jobs as quickly as possible. But would my right honourable friend agree that as well as an investigation into the corporate behaviour and director's decisions and future protection for pensioners and so on, could his department oversee also looking at the aviation sector, a great British strength in general, to see whether there are parts of that sector, and in particular package tour operators, who haven't adjusted to changing circumstances as quickly as they should, and see what more can be done? My honourable friend's absolutely right. There are very profitable parts of this, this sector. One large British airlines just made uh, profit, uh, record um, profits and shows that there is money to be made in the sector. But it, I wouldn't want to be in a position of dictating to the sector how they run their businesses and some will succeed and some won't. Where I am 
very passionately interested, is that when they do go wrong, as has been discussed, the problems don't fall, fall on the taxpayer's shoulders. Alison McGovern. Tell the Secretary of State that my constituents are not happy with the government's response. Yeah, yeah. But at the heart of this problem is a company that was signed off by auditors last year. And the government know that the audit system is not working well, and they had the Kingman review look into this and make recommendations. On behalf of his cross-government arrangements that he's speaking for here, what have they been doing to reform audit along with those recommendations that they themselves asked for? Yes. Yes. I know, because the, the Honourable Lady is uh, well versed in these matters, that there are moves afoot to uh, change the process, and we have uh, expressed ourselves concerns over the uh, audit uh, uh, approach in this, in this country. Now, I don't want to completely jump to conclusions. Because you read it in the weekend paper doesn't always mean it is uh, true. I read that the repatriation was going to cost £600 million, which, again, to the taxpayer, is not the case. Um, so we do need to allow the process to uh, work the way through. And I know that she uh, is very actively involved in ensuring that the way that uh, auditing takes place in this country uh, is changed and improved. And the cross party, the cross uh, task force will uh, no doubt be working on that as well. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Secretary of State for the support he's giving to Thomas Cook employees in the Havant constituency. Can he reassure me that British officials and embassies and missions around the world are also working hard to provide support where needed? Yeah. Well, I must pay tribute to the extraordinary work that they've done uh, in the foreign missions around the world. I'm very grateful to the Foreign Commonwealth Office, without whom we couldn't do this, and also to put on record my thanks to the surge staff from HMRC as well as CAA staff who have been absolute troopers throughout the world in airports everywhere. People in Greater Manchester have lost their jobs, including many in Wigan, but the Scandinavian subsidiary of Thomas Cook is still flying, the German subsidiary is still flying. The government hasn't just failed to provide the financial assistance that would have been necessary to keep those companies going, but it's failed to bring forward legislation that would enable those airlines in the UK to continue flying in protective administration. It didn't have to be like this. This government hasn't barely brought anything to this House over recent months, and they don't need a Queen's speech in order to do this, yeah. Mr Speaker. They should do it right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The Honourable Lady uh, confuses two points. I mean, it's absolutely true, as I've said many times, that we need a new administration regime, but the fundamental difference that she refers to in the Scandinavian and the German examples is the profitability of the underlying business in those markets due to different influences in their particular markets and the way the businesses have been run at that sub-level. Kevin Olin Rake. Does my right honourable friend agree that we should always be cautious about bailing out private sector businesses, yeah, yeah, particularly yeah, yeah. ones that are £1.9 billion in debt and yeah, struggle yeah. to make money even in a good year? But should we also look at our competition's policy and are trying to avoid businesses getting so big that when they fail, they have such a widespread effect on UK consumers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think my, my honourable friend makes a very good point in, indeed. And we do get back to this fundamental point that I know is causing some concern on the uh, opposite side, that the, the business has to be underlying profitable, otherwise there is nothing to bail out, there is nothing to lend money to. And when money is being lost at that sort of rate, the idea that yet more taxpayers' money is pumped in to something which will lose it in a matter of weeks or months seems to me to be crazy. Malcolm MacDonald. Now, what advice does the Secretary have for my constituent, Alan Patterson, stuck right now in Ibiza, who hadn't realised he was entitled to a repatriation flight home, but he wanted to get back for his new job this weekend and has spent hundreds of pounds on flights that he didn't need to buy in the first place? KLM are now refusing to refund him that money. Doesn't he agree with me that's mean-spirited and they shouldn't be profiting out of this disaster? Yeah, I'm very sorry to hear about the example, the, the situation for his constituent, and uh, no airline should be trying to profit out of this um, situation. As I've mentioned, in particular, the UK airlines have actually uh, really tried to um, assist once we got over this issue of some initial surge pricing that seemed to kick in. They have, for the most part, been extraordinarily helpful, lending aircraft, cutting some of their prices. Very concerned to hear about this KLM case. I don't know yet. Vicky Ford, I don't know. Thank you. Mr Speaker, we're living through a digital age and businesses which don't adapt will struggle. But can I thank the government for thinking about the people who have been affected here 
What assistance is there likely to be for people who have bought flights or holidays that haven't yet started? There's a large number of people who will have bought um, holidays which have yet to start. Uh, if they were package holidays, they are at all protected and they will simply get that money back. Whereas flights only, uh, they do not automatically get that money back and they want to refer to their credit cards, debit cards, holiday uh, insurance and sometimes an alternate travel agent from whom they uh, booked it. Please, Dodds. Thank you. Yes, there are legal differences between the UK and Germany, but there's a big, big difference in political will as well. Yes, the Secretary yes. of State keeps mentioning Air Berlin, so I've got one little question for him, general knowledge question. <laughs> the German government loan that was provided to Air Berlin that enabled its operations to be transferred in a planned manner into exactly. other companies, exactly. has it been paid back or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's say the, the, no. <laughs> the big difference with other um, airlines which are uh, surviving and even sub, sub surviving within this group are the profitability of the airlines um, themselves. But you, I, I think we've gone round this uh, quite a few times, Mr. Speaker. I'm in agreement with the Honourable Lady that we do need to have uh, an airline administration system which enables airlines to continue flying. But those two differences, profitability and or the ability to be in administration are fundamental differences to, what the, to the situation that existed here. Uh, and so the idea, which is I think the third option that she's trying to inject into this, that somehow, for some crazed reason, the government wouldn't want to do everything possible to try to save uh, a 178-year-old British icon is completely ridiculous. Of course we wouldn't want to. Master turn. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Thomas Cook branch in Clarkson was operated by a small but excellent team now uh, worried about their futures and it also occupied a key high street unit. So I very much welcome the cross uh, departmental task force. But can the Secretary of State ensure that members across the House continue to be updated as to its progress so that we continue, can continue to provide the best support and advice to our constituents? I will absolutely ask my right honourable friend to make sure that that happens and uh, continue to take a keen interest in it myself. Susan Ellen Jones. Uh, my constituents and many, many other people's constituents across the country have been affected by this awful situation. But what I don't understand is government and opposition and pretty much everyone recognise we need new le legislation on it. Why, why the heck do we have to wait for a new clean speech? Yeah. Why can't we have emergency legislation next week? Yeah. 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 Well, I think this has been the most interesting part of this, after, uh, this afternoon, as has been discussed. Uh, we've got an airline insolvency uh, review that has now reported and there seems to be very strong uh, desire across the House to do something uh, with that. Um, so let's talk about it. Mike Wood. Speaker, will my right honourable friend uh, work with other uh, travel companies as well as ministerial colleagues to make sure that the skills of Thomas Cook employees up and down the country can be retained within the sector? My uh, honourable friend would be pleased to know that the skills are in a high demand and many of the other travel companies are uh, employing and indeed as we've heard from other honourable members, uh, both airlines as well as skill uh, centres uh, such as those in Stansted uh, are actually actively reaching out. So I'm very hopeful uh, that those who will have lost their jobs through uh, Thomas Cook will in fact be uh, employed very quickly within the travel sector. Kate Green. Mr Speaker, what discussions is the government having with the commercial lending sector, both in relation to the very substantial debt uh, that is going to be the legacy of this debacle, but also in relation to the personal debt of employees? Some of my constituents are extremely concerned about the attitude of their creditors to their mortgage yeah, and other loans. Absolutely, yeah, well, I can tell the, uh, the Honourable Lady that the, uh, my right honourable friend, the Business Secretary, is actually writing um, to the lenders on this specific uh, point uh, and so perhaps can provide a more detail about uh, uh, what she's asked them um, to do at this dispatch box or I'll actually ask her to write separately. Um, but it's also the, the case that we'll be uh, looking to provide as much support as possible and it's important to remember that the deal that uh, Thomas Cook was trying to arrange was actually with the Chinese company for £900 uh, million. Pounds. So the corporate funding part of this is another interesting part that is, uh, I know, something will be unpacked over time. Andrew Bowie. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. On behalf of my constituents in Aberdeenshire who found themselves in difficulty of late, can I thank 
my right honourable friend, all the staff at the Department for Transport and the CAA. But for those people who might find themselves in difficulty after the two-week period of the official operation has ended, will he commit that his staff at the Department for Transport and the CAA will continue their support for people who will find themselves in difficulty in a fortnight's time? I should mention why it's a two-week period. It's actually because the holidays mostly uh, coincide with those dates, uh, people coming back on the normal day of the holiday, after which point there would be sufficient uh, capacity in the travel system to get people home on regular commercial flights, and we'll stand by people who have already booked, are already out there, and perhaps we're on a two-and-a-half-week uh, holiday to get them home uh, by alternate means. Stephen Dowdy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've had many constituents, from pilots to holiday reps, contact me who've been affected by this crisis. I wondered if the Secretary of State is aware that some uh, former and current employees, until very recently, of Thomas Cook, are affected themselves because employee holiday benefits don't appear to be covered by Atoll. So I know of a, one constituent who has a family member who's currently in Turkey, unable to claim who used employee holiday benefits and is now stuck as a result and not covered by Atoll. So will he look urgently at that yeah, matter? Because it's a double whammy yeah. for the the employees of Thomas Cook. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's right. The honourable gentleman will know that the strict rules that apply for the insolvency service for people's redundancy pay, which does cover uh, the holiday uh, element as well as the non-holiday element itself being uh, uh, tax-free and a redundancy. Uh, but actually, uh, in a case like that, I'd be very happy to receive a letter from the honourable gentleman and look into the case for his constituent. And Dr Lisa Cameron. Will the Secretary of State pay tribute to Peel Park firm AGO Outsourcing in my constituency, who are very keen to offer job opportunities for the staff affected in our two stores? And um, That's really uh, remarkable, and we're so pleased that they're doing that. But East Kilbride is particularly affected, and I'd be very grateful if the Secretary of State would arrange a meeting for myself with the task force to make sure I can help people on the front line. Uh, absolutely very pleased to play, pay tribute to the employers in her constituency who are providing or offering employment. Uh, and she's not the first member this afternoon who has um, suggested that there are other people uh, who are uh, stepping in to take up this employment. Very happy also to ask my uh, right honourable friend to set up that meeting. Mr. Those of my constituents who have lost their jobs uh, tell me that the airline was indeed profitable. So why didn't the government intervene to make sure that the airline and any other parts of the business which were profitable, uh, along with the jobs in those businesses, could have been saved? I, uh, I, I'm interested to hear the, uh, the, his constituents say that. I mean, the, the accounts clearly show that within a six-month period alone, they lost a billion and a half. Uh, and then issued a further profits warning. There's obviously a lot of detangling of this business to be um, done. I, I mean, I have to say that, you know, it, that a government isn't in the job of, uh, in the business of running a travel com company, you'd understand, uh, but we do uh, want to ensure that whatever went wrong here is properly investigated and we'll make, certainly make sure that does happen. Ms McInnes. The Secretary of State talks about throwing good money after bad, but surely it would be better for British business if Thomas Cook had been bailed out rather than spending millions of pounds on repatriating holidaymakers. Yeah. Yeah. I made mention to do the 900 million Fosan uh, deal, uh, which eventually uh, fell through, just to try to indicate the extent of the money required in this business, just to keep it afloat. And then it turned out in fact, and that was the deal that was on the table whilst all, the, uh, all, all of this was going on. And then it turned out at the 11th hour that even Fosun weren't happy to go with a, a deal because they themselves had concern. And then a new number started to emerge of an ex additional £250 million. I think any rational person, including, incidentally, the accounting officers uh, throughout government, would have looked at this deal and refused to sign off 